This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Lara Mazza. How are you? Doing great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, it. Thanks for coming on the show. You are part of the Colombo family. Yes. Involved with murders, racketeering, all the, all the mad stuff that the mafia do. Yeah. But it's good to have you on. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank How's you. life? Everything is going fabulous. Amazing. You know, uh, for the people that don't know, uh, you know, I went through a war, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, you know, an internal family war with the Colombo family. And I did 10 years, uh, got home and started over. I wrote a book about my life. Uh, I've got a good business going now. I have a, a fitness center in Cocoa Beach. And things are going real well. Good. Before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start with my yes. guests to get a better understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Mm -hmm. Grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, come from a completely normal a uh, law-abiding family. Uh, you know, my dad was a fireman, New York. I uh, actually became a lieutenant. My mom worked in a bank uh, some years. She didn't work the whole time. You know, she was there to bring us up. Uh, went to Catholic school, played every sport you could imagine. Uh, I got into kickboxing. Uh, then I became a coach. I still coach. That's how I stayed in the gym business later on. Uh, but a perfectly normal upbringing. How was family life, mom and dad? It, great. I mean, I never wanted for anything. Uh, like I said, my dad was a lieutenant in the fire department, wasn't rich, made a decent living, worked overtime, did everything to get us through to better schools, uh, all the way up to high school. And he was ready to pay for me in college, too. You know, he paid for my brother and sister to go to college. So, uh, you know, it was really, really, you know, somebody once said it was like, leave it to Beaver, just a normal uh environment there were no drugs uh my dad was always around helping coach you know uh when we were playing ball and things like that so uh and my mom was great too i mean we just had a a, a good family what were you like at school i did very well even though i didn't apply myself i would get b's and a's and i only took a notebook to school i didn't go through the books and everything i i, I absorbed what the teacher was saying it stuck, and I did well. I, I, and my father used to scratch his head and say, how do you get these grades, and you're not even trying? And he used to tell me, you could be a top guy. You could be the top guy, whatever you do. I just didn't like it. I just I wanted to go play ball. I wanted to go to the gym. You know, I enjoyed that more than sitting home and studying. Uh, I should have. So how did you get involved with the mafia life? Coming from a good family, mom and dad, pretty mm -hmm. decent at school, not violent. Now, this, what happened? This is what is so unique. Uh, I was in high school getting ready to graduate. So I was a little over 17. I had a few jobs. One of the jobs I had was uh, in a supermarket called Danzas. They had like 11 supermarkets in throughout Brooklyn. And one of my duties uh, of many was to deliver big, large orders 
to houses. They, the women would come in, fill up the boxes, and then I would deliver it to their house. And on one of those deliveries, I met a, a, an older woman. You know, at that time, she was about 30, maybe 31. Uh, I remember later on, she lied and told me she was 29. I lied and said I was over 18 because I saw we were heading for, uh, you know, an affair. And that's ultimately what happened. You know, I would deliver to her house. And after a while, we got more and more friendly. Uh, she offered me, you know, lunch, drinks, soft drinks is all like, because I was working. But later on, I would go back in the evenings and then have wine. And uh, we wound up becoming lovers. And to answer your question, her husband or her common law husband was a capo in the Colombo family and uh, a very feared man named Greg Scarpa. He's called the Grim Reaper. That was his nickname. And here I was having an affair with his wife. After about six months, she wanted me now to meet him. So that was hard for me. And I, I fought it off. I says, I'm not going to do that. I can't meet your husband. This is crazy, you know. Uh, but what happened, they were opening a business, a supply company. They needed a, a, a regional salesman. And she said, you could be the sales manager. You have to meet my husband. I know he'll put you in. Finally, I go and I meet with him. And the minute I met him at the house, I knew you know, up to that point, she didn't tell me who he was. She told me he was influential. She told me he knows a lot of people. Uh, but never did I know until he pulled up in the big black Fleetwood with the spoke hubcaps, tinted windows, sunglasses, even though it was nighttime. You know, and he swaggered over to the door. He didn't walk. He swaggered. And uh, full of jewelry and, you know, diamond watch, all that stuff. I knew this man was different. I said, this is now, this, I pictured gangsters from TV. Because again, I'm not even 18, maybe 18 by now. I'm about 18. So uh, we meet that night. We get to the restaurant and his partners are there. One's a lawyer, one's an accountant, and one is the company, the supply company, uh, CEO, whatever. When we sit down, he introduces me and he tells them, say hello to the new sales manager. Doesn't ask their opinion, doesn't request, doesn't nominate me, tells them this is a new sales manager. And they shook my hand. They were thanking me up and down. The whole restaurant was treating me like a prince. And again, little did I know this would be the life to come. So that's how I got to meet him and got into the family because later on, the most unique part of this story is that we got very close. And he confided in me about having other wives. He had another wife in New Jersey. He had another one in Vegas and Manhattan. So he had these multiple families. And he eventually gave his approval to allow us to continue this affair. But he told me, as long as nobody outside of the three of us knows, if anybody finds out, he says, you and I will be killed. So at 19 now, that's like the first time I'm understanding a rule of our lifestyle. You can't mess around with each other's wives, which is sensible, makes sense. Uh, you shouldn't do that in any walk of life. Uh, but I would be killed. And I said, I'm a 19-year-old kid. They're going to kill me? You know, it just it was, imagine hearing that at 19, we'll be killed if anybody finds out. I, it was like surreal. Uh, but now the weight of the world was off my shoulders because up until that point, I was paranoid. Here he is. He's going out to New Jersey for two nights. I'm sleeping over his house. I said, one day he's going to come home early. One day he's going to catch us. Something's, and we were starting to take chances too as this affair went on and it grew to really a, you know, a love affair. It wasn't a joke. You know, it went on for almost 10 years. So, you know, it wasn't uh, just an overnight. And it got to the point where I felt like I was backstabbing him and I was really paranoid. I wasn't myself. And that's what, prompted him to open up this conversation with me and I remember when he did it I was nervous I thought he was going to kill me if I admit it but if, by the end of the conversation he had me comfortable and I says I Greg I, you're far from an idiot and only an idiot wouldn't see what's going on and he banged the desk he laughed he got up we walked outside and that's when he told me about the rule 
So, but now, again, the weight of the world was off my shoulders. We were tight, and it only made us closer as the years went on. Believe it or not, you know, sharing the same woman, it made us closer. Yeah, someone fucking your wife is, that's, you know then he's psychotic. You know he's off his fucking head. Well, you know. <laughs> did the wife know that he'd be okay with it? <clears throat> that's the, Why did she not listen, tell you straight away? That's I, At the beginning, he didn't know. Somewhere along the way, I started sensing a change in her. Like she wasn't so worried. She was very callous about it, making jokes about it. I'm going to tell him, you know. So somewhere along the way, I believe she did tell him, or they had a conversation. Or they found out. Well, I don't think he found out like that. But here's the thing. I'm going to tell you my opinion. It might clarify how he allowed it. Like I said, he had all these other women in his life. He was 20 years older than her. Okay, so juggling all these women has to be tough. Okay, and she was the youngest. She was his trophy. And I think he knew all those times away at her age, eventually she's going to start going out. Maybe it would be embarrassing to him. Uh, I made his life easier. Like I said, he got to know me, he liked me, and I can't make excuses for him, or, or I'm just trying to answer that question as to why I think he allowed it, and I just believe I made his life easier, and he was comfortable with it, he had her, you know, he had his other wives, he would go to Vegas with one, I dropped him off at the airport, so I know he was gone for three days, you know, and at the beginning, I felt bad, I said, now I'm going to go back and sleep with his wife for three days, but once he knew, you know, it made our lives easier. It, it, I guess it's an alternative lifestyle. <laughs> you know? Was there a swinger? I don't think so. I don't think so because, uh, and I've been asked that once or twice, not too often, but I don't think so. I don't think he, uh, you know, he had a, is, is, he still had a lot of old fashioned ways to him. You know, most older mob guys do. Uh, he just marched to his own beat. You know, a lot of them had the Gumata on his side, the girlfriend. A lot of them had that. He had three. He had three or four. I mean, he was just a swashbuckler, pirate, or, you know, a lawyer once said, no matter what time period he came from, he would have been the worst. If he was a pirate, he would have been Blackbeard. If he was uh, a Viking, he would have been, you know, Thor, or one of those guys. He would have just been the worst of the worst, no matter what he was in. And he was one of the worst gangsters. So you get involved with the mafia because of an affair? That's how it started, yep. So uh, what's the steps then to then prove well, yourself as a, a mafia guy? Well, here's what happens. They, first of all, the older mob guys, the bosses, the guys that are in the life, they typically don't look for thugs. They don't look for uh, low-level whatever to just recruit. They want to see a guy that was brought up with some sense of manners, loyalty, uh brains they don't want there's enough thugs out there that hang around so if you're going to get closer into the inner circle you're going to be handpicked okay so he saw i had attributes that he wanted me to be like him be around him he trusted me uh so what happened i was on the fire department list to become fireman like my father and back this is like in 81 80 probably 80 uh, maybe even 79, but way back. But what happened was I got a 99 on the written and I got a 95 on the physical. So out of the 12,000 people that took this test, I was like in the top 500. I would have been picked very soon. But at the time, minorities and women put in a lawsuit saying the test was too tough. It was too hard. It wasn't fair. So it took two years for a judge to decide on that issue. After the two years, he rules against, he rules for them and against all the poor guys that were on the, that were waiting for the job. Now he schedules the next test for two more years down the road. So this is four years I'm sitting around doing nothing, but I did start working for the supply company. And this, again, will lead me to answer your question. After about a year at a supply company, I was building up a good little resume, a good book. I was going in and out of stores. At first, I had a lot of help. If they didn't order from me, Greg would send somebody, and the next day, they'd take an order from me. So I had help becoming a good salesman. But uh, after about a year, the company 
dissolves because there was a big fire in the warehouse, destroyed everything. So later on, when I really got to know him well, I always wondered if it was just an insurance thing, if he's the hell with this, because he hated legitimate businesses. He didn't like, like them. So I think he just wanted to get all his money back, maybe make a score, and that was it. But I got caught in the crossfire now because now I'm not in school anymore. I was in John Jay College, which is right not far from where we are now in Columbus Circle. Uh, and I, uh, I don't have a job, and I'm not on the list anymore. So Linda says, you got to do something for him. We can't just leave him like this. So he brings me in, and his wisdom is, I'll start doing numbers with him, take the number business. Now, the number business was already established, and the number business is the lowest form of business in Cosa Nostra. I mean, in the whole thing, it's the lowest starting point. You literally write down numbers. Somebody will give you a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. You go to factories. They already had established stops, so... I went to some of those, and I would get the numbers. So, long story short, and this is back again in 79, 80, so it may not sound like a lot, but it adds up. I was making 100, 150 a day, just picking up the numbers. And it's cash, and there's no tax. It just goes right in my pocket. But I learned how to enhance it. And he saw that. He saw I was good with numbers. He saw I was smart. And he gave me more of the rope. So I went and established other spots. One of them was in what was called off-track betting. Are you familiar with OTB from years ago? Yeah. Off-track betting. I said, they're gamblers in there. They're betting horses all day. So I went into these places, and I was getting numbers. Then I said, these guys are betting at OTB, and whenever they win, OTB takes out like 7%. So I started taking their horse action, too. I said, they might as well bet with me. I'll pay you the full-track price. So now I would go in, I would write horse bets, I would write the numbers. <laughs> that led to sports betting. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. Those gamblers wanted to bet everything and anything. So I would go in with Paul A cards, which is also very low on the on the totem pole of business. And I started picking up maybe another 100 a day. So now here I am. I'm 20 years old. Don't have a job, but I'm making 200 a day. You know, I brought some friends in. They started going to other OTBs. Now I was getting a piece of what they were earning. So they were making 100 a day, and I'm making an extra 25 or 30 from each of them, 50, whatever it was. So I'm learning the way how this happens. Ultimately, and again, I'm cutting to the chase. Greg Jr., who was second in command at the club, and that's obviously Greg's son, he gives the whole sports business to me. He says, this kid, is, what am I going to do? He's way better than me. So he gave me the whole sports business. Now I grew an incredible gambling mini empire in New York. We had hundreds and hundreds of players. Uh, let's see this table here. You could fill them with names of the people. That's We have these big pages to, to keep track of everything. And it also uh, opens the door to Shylocking. Now, I'm going to explain that to you. Shylocking is loan shocking. You lend money at very high rates. That now is more of an evil business, okay? I guess that's the right word. Gambling, nobody ever looked at me in a bad way. Nobody says, oh my God, look, he's a bookmaker. He's terrible. He's a bad man. Bookmakers were all around. Numbers, guys. It was part of Brooklyn. It was part of growing up. And, you know, if a person uh, is reasonable, you know, I was always reasonable. I hated to bring them to see him because a lot of times they got hurt when that happened early on. Then later on, I learned that has to happen sometimes. Uh, but the, what happens, people lose money gambling and they can't pay. So they borrow from a Shylock. I became that Shylock, even though I was also the bookmaker. I says, all right, you owe me 2000. You could pay three points on it. You bring me $60 a week. 
And you can owe me the 2000 as long as you want, but you got to bring me the 2000 to stop the $60. And sometimes people would pay me for three, four years, $60 a week. Multiply that by 50 people. This is how I became successful financially, too, at the time, considering, again, I'm a young kid. Now I'm making maybe, you know, early on, 1500 a week Shylock in the sports business, who knows how much. Uh, and getting closer and closer and getting that trust and now Greg starts seeing a future for me in that life. And Linda wants me to be a good fella. She says, you going to be a made guy, you know? And at first it didn't mean that much to me. I didn't understand what it meant, you know, but when you're in the life, that's a protection. Okay. You need to get that eventually. If you are going to rise and be a man's man and be a leader, and have people around you. So I understand why he wanted that. And, it, and again, I'll fast forward a little bit. Later on, his son goes to prison. He gets a long prison sentence. Greg gets sick. So he puts my name in because if anything happens to them, I'm his closest person and he's going to want me to have that protection, to be a made guy where nobody could come and take what's mine. Who has Greg and his son for people who don't know? A made guy? Oh. Yeah, no, who is Greg and his son for people who don't know? Yeah, well, yeah, Greg is uh, Greg Scarpa. That's the father. Uh, and he was a longtime boss's man with the Colombo family. Uh, what a boss's man is, he doesn't have a title. He could go direct to the boss. And he did, which makes him literally higher than the captain. And he had that status from Profaci to Joe Colombo to Carmine Persico, who were all the bosses along the way. His son, Greg Jr., was one of many kids. He had like, you know, six kids uh, pr and probably more. We found out later on that's a few would otherwise. But anyway, let's say six kids. Greg Jr. was the oldest son. And he's the only one, well, the youngest one later on followed in the footsteps and got killed at a very young age. And I totally blame the father for that. Uh, but Greg Jr. was a chip off the old block. He was, he liked the life. He got in the life uh, and he had he tried very hard to impress his father with his toughness and he was tough uh, and he became a shooter and, you know, he elevated to official captain. He went actually higher than his father. His father was never an official captain, but the respect his father got was still light years more than uh, you know, Gregory or any of us would ever get. He has been around a long time. So Greg Scarpa was the father, and we called Gregory uh, Gregory or Greg Jr. Jr., you know. So I still call him. Gregory is, is the younger one, and Greg is the father to me. And all this, should, the affair still going on. Was the, was the Grim Reaper still having, still sleeping with this woman as well? Or was she yours by then? Was it your partner? his wife Linda yeah. no we were to me it was just me and her did she try did she groom you as well into that oh, life absolutely absolutely and when uh, she wanted me to be a good fella from a very young age she was proud when I started doing things with Greg she would beam she would smile she'd tell Greg see I told you he's a tough guy you know like I belonged and I ate that up because I cared for her. So when she would do that, I, I was like, okay, you know, this is good. Would you have done anything for her? Yeah, somebody you truly love, you you, you would, yeah. But this I is an, an older woman as yeah. well. When you actually look at it, she must have been fucking crazy. She seemed to have liked that life where she oh. wanted to be with a bad man because you weren't. She probably felt better that you were turning into one. Yeah. Well, no, she, <laughs> she liked that life without a doubt. She was around it from 16 years old. She started dating Greg, and he was like 38 when they were dating. I mean, that's crazy. Uh, and she definitely liked the respect she got because she was his. She loved the money. We all love money. There's nothing wrong with that, but this was her easiest way to get a lot of money. Uh, and she had the jewelry. She had the fur coats back in the day. So, no, she loved it, but I think... If she ever envisioned us at some point being together, like maybe, you know, in, in the dangerous life he was in, or he's much older and he could, you know, get a heart attack and die. I mean, again, you're 50s, 60s is older. You know, we were younger. Uh, 
she would want me to be in the, that type of life. See, did you feel pressure to try and keep her happy? Yeah, as a kid, it's like almost like peer pressure. Mm. I wanted her to uh, be proud of me. I didn't want to look inferior to the other men. The other men that were in that club all looked up to as tough guys, neighborhood leaders and tough guys. Uh, the inner circle, I mean, not the thugs that are hanging around. Nobody looks up at them. Uh, but the guys that are in that club every day, driving to and from places with Greg, I, I became his driver. Every day we pulled in together. So we were inseparable. Uh, and yeah, no, I felt that peer pressure. That's the best way to put it. Not that it was peer pressure because she wasn't a friend. She was my significant other at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. But being young, impressionable, you know, uh, naive, all those things came into play because, and I've said this several times, the recruitable ones are never seasoned guys that have been around a long, long time. Like my father could never get, you know, pulled into this life, but at 17, you can, because you see the good stuff. You see the, 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 the caddies and the Lincolns and the Mercedes Benz and beautiful watches. And, you know, you see that and it's easy to want that. You know, uh, but once you get older and you have kids and you and you you you're more seasoned about life, you realize that's not everything. It's nice to have money. Everybody has the right to earn a good living and and whatever. Uh, even a hustle, even if you're hustling, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, but there comes a line where now <laughs> we're not supposed to sell drugs, which I never did. Uh, but you see it around. Now you say, okay, that's a rule. We're not supposed to be selling drugs. And I see it happening openly. And as long as they're getting a piece, the big shots get a few bucks. They're well, well more than a few bucks. It, they don't, it's okay. Once those kids get pinched selling the drugs, they're not allowed to cop out. They can't because then they're admitting it. So they got to take 20 year sentences, you know, and some of them start flipping. They're not going to take 20 years or whatever. Uh, so you start getting, seeing this, you start seeing the backstabbing and the treachery that uh the lying they tell you one thing but they're doing something else and ultimately our crew got dismantled by the dea because greg jr when he became a captain he started taxing drug dealers he wasn't selling drugs but if he knew you were selling drugs on the street corner making two thousand a night you were giving him 25 percent. and if you didn't you got hurt if you didn't you got hurt again got hurt again Ultimately, they started killing guys that weren't kicking in, that were bucking the system. And he got away with that by saying, I'm not selling drugs. I'm just shaking them down. I'm taxing them. And he was giving a big piece to the family captain, Scappy, our captain. And he would give a piece, obviously, to the boss, Junior. So they knew, and it was enormous money. I'm talking bagfuls of money every few hours coming in from uh, gamb oh, gamblers, that's my thing, from drug dealers around the city. It was really scary to, to look at, you know, and I knew they were under scrutiny. You could see the FBI out there, you could see the vans out, but they didn't care. They were just, uh, you know, it, it got out of hand and the whole crew wound up doing big time for that. Gregory's crew, I was directly to Big Greg and I avoided that. I stayed away from the drugs and that's why I escaped and, and stayed on the street a lot longer than most of them. What did your mom and dad say? Well, early on, they didn't know. They, even when the supply company closed, I didn't tell them it closed. I was making money. And I remember him saying it, like, you know, even in my book, uh, the kid had money. He was never asked us for anything. He had a nice car. He, he, he you know, uh, n n never seen him come home like drunk or on drugs. I had no reason to worry about anything. And he didn't because I had my own apartment in the, in, in my, in our house. Uh, and like he did say, I came home, I did, I paid my bills. I actually kicked in. I gave him a little rent money. He didn't want it, but I said, no, I have to get a place somewhere. I don't mind. You know, I was showing him I was becoming a man, you know? Uh, so, but you become a, a deceitful and a liar. You have to, you have to, because now as time goes on and I'm dropping him off to kill somebody and I come home and maybe they see I'm a little, you know, I'm not. I said, nah, I just got an upset, so I don't feel good. You know, I'm not going to tell him I just dropped Greg off to kill a guy and drove him away afterwards, you know. Uh, so they, they, excuse me, they, they don't know really the depth, 
how deep I had gotten until fast forward later on when we went through the war and the FBI pinched us all. Then it comes out in open court and they're sitting there and I'm called the deadliest member of the Scarpa crew. He's part of multiple murders, you know, and I'm saying, oh my God, my poor parents, you know, it's tough, it's tough. And by then I was married to my uh, first wife. I had a son. So, uh, you know, that's when you really, your eyes get op really open up. So when you're doing the bookie thing, you're making a bit of money. When did you start getting violent? Well, people don't pay, okay? So I mentioned earlier, I would try very hard to be reasonable to work with them. But now, as I was, I was getting deeper in, my commitments to Greg were more. I had to pay him more money too. So when they didn't pay, it hurt me. So I would have to bring them to see him. So the first couple of times... Gregory and his guys would bring him in the back and go to work on. Him. Now I started feeling responsible. I'm having these guys beat up my people, you know, and I, and I, I actually felt inferior. I said, I don't, you know. So down the road, if they didn't pay, me and my guys would crack them around uh, to set an example. And the worst violence, the, the, the murders, you don't get thrust into one untested. Baby steps. They bring you in. Like I said, one of the first things I did was uh, drive him somewhere. The next day I found out that Bucky, is the guy's name, who was in our crew, got killed. And it was in that bar that I dropped him off at. I don't say anything. You can't say anything. That's a test. It's a test. Am I going to go in there, Greg, what happened here? Did you do that? You know, I can't do that. I got to just keep my mouth shut. He asked me to give a guy a flat tire once. The next day in the newspaper, man killed fixing flat. And the newspapers are right on the bar in our social club. So the men are reading it. They're laughing. I go by, see the newspaper out. And I say, I gave that guy the flat. I know the car. It's the freaking silver caddy or white caddy, whatever it was. You know, I says, I gave him a flat. But in the back of my head, I'm saying, well, I didn't kill him. I just gave him a flat. But I'm part of that conspiracy. It's about say, yeah. Yeah, I'm part of it. So this goes on little by little. And I've said it several times. And it's, you know, it's it's an analogy partly, but it's true. We did dig graves. Uh, he asked me to get a shovel. Just buy a shovel. I don't ask him, what's the shovel for, Greg? I'm in my head. I'm saying to myself, they're digging a hole. You know, somebody's going. Then the next time you're asked to dig the hole. And I dug one alongside Greg Jr. once. You know, a body's going in there. So little by little, then something may happen on a personal level. They don't ask you to kill your best friend. There's so many guys that are ready to kill. They don't need that. And why, why ask me to kill my, think about it. Why ask me to kill my best friend when I may go tell my best friend, get out of town, you know, I, that's what I would do if it was my best friend. And a lot of us would do that. So that's a myth. They always say, oh, you got to kill your best friend. Not that it never happens, okay, down the road when you're deeper in and you're both big shots and you're both fighting over the same monies or whatever, that shit happens. It just happens. Uh, but getting back to my point of baby steps, something personal may happen. And in my case, something personal did happen. It was Greg's youngest daughter, little Linda, she was named after the mom, nearly gets raped. Okay, a car service driver takes her to a park instead of to school. She was only about 14, 15. Yeah. So that afternoon, we went to the car service, had the guy who owned the car service give us the address of this driver. At first, he didn't want to give it. Greg leaned over whispered something in his ear. He couldn't write the address fast enough. He probably told him, I'll kill you right here. You know, and he's very convincing. Greg Scarp was convincing. He had a deep voice. He had a stone hard look. Not bad looking guy, but just a stone hard look. Uh, there's some historic pictures of him in front of the club and you just look at him, you see this, his picture would be in the dictionary on the gangster, you know? So anyway, we go and we, about four or five of us, me, Joey, Carmine, Sal, uh, four of us and Greg give this guy a beating 
that I think the message came back that we'll tell you the bones that weren't broken. <laughs> That's how many bones we broke. I mean, his, from his nose to his chin to his ribs to his knees. I mean, he was just like, hey. but you know what? It didn't bother me because this garbage, you know, if she, the little girl didn't handle it right and she handled it real good, she convinced him that let's not do it this way. I'd rather you come and pick me up someday and we go somewhere. You know, she turned it around. And I found this out way later on that that's how she got out of that. But so again, at that point, I didn't care. So he knew that I would be okay with that. And I would want to do that for Big Linda too. So he took me on that one. And that was vicious. But somewhere along the way, and I remember telling him because he asked me afterwards, he said, I should have killed this guy. Now he's talking to me. I want to kill this guy. I, I can't let this guy live. Why did they let him live? Why did they let him live? Well, at first I think, and I said this to him later, I says, don't you think it's better the beating we gave him as a message to others? You know, people are going to hear about that. They're going to see this guy. Cause service. I, I mean, sometimes it's good to just leave a message, you know? Uh, if he had gone the distance, then yeah, I'd say, just kill him right now. What are we waiting for, you know? But being somewhat level-headed, this is a conversation I have with him. But I think he was getting pressure from Big Linda too. She couldn't, she wanted him gone. I remember that. And she almost looked at us as weak for not doing it. And I think he felt that way now. So we came up with a plan where we would call the car service. It took him about two or three months to even get back in the car, maybe more than that. I forget, at least a few months. And we would call the car service. And until he showed up as the driver, we did it like six or seven times. Finally, I said, that's him. And we had a, uh, I was at the door. And when I saw it was him, I would nod and then Carmine would hit the lights and they would come out and get in the car. And uh, Gregory was actually the main shooter there. So now I'm on the scene of a hit. And again, it's not, I'm not losing sleep over this one. You know, let's, everybody could look in the mirror themselves. If it was your wife, your daughter, your loved one, how, wouldn't you want him? Most people would say, I want him dead. Yeah, Most percent. people would yeah, say yeah, that. Percent. Very few people would say, I'll, I'll let the cops handle it. They're not because he's going to get a year and a half in jail, if that much. If that, yeah. If that, exactly. So, you know, there's a, there's a place for street justice. There, there, there is. I still believe that. You know, I'm not a cop caller. I, I'd rather handle it myself, even to this day, and let the chips fall. I'm not going to call the cops. It's not my style. Never was. So anyway, then the next one was Greg Jr. I, and maybe, I, I may be out of order. I, it's been so long. I'm 60, almost 63. This was in my 20s. I mean, you know, uh, and there were so many with this crew, you know, the Grim Reaper that it's just hard. But one, another early one was Greg Jr., gets in a beef in his bar. It's called On the Rocks. That was his nightclub. And the local guy that he got in the beef with was a known tough guy. And they're walking out of his bar to have it out. And four or five guys come with Greg Jr. That's our style. You know, unfortunately, as tough as some of the guys, Gregory was tough, but he's not going to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. Same with me after the years. I was a martial artist. I could handle myself. Not the toughest guy in the world by no means, but I could handle myself. I never needed, you know, five guys to back me. But in that life, they're not going to let me raise my hands. I'm going to have five guys beat. Like I, I pulled a guy over once to beat him up myself. And next thing I knew, three guys that know me, well, they were all guys, Fat Larry, Fat Danny, and another fat guy, Dean. They were driving by. Fat bastards. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's their nickname. <laughs> so they were driving by and saw this. I had to stop them. Oh, easy, easy. I gave them enough is enough. They were going to beat them to death. But that's because I was Larry, Greg's nephew. And they were also up and coming guys. And today they moved up. They're in the life right now. So, I, you know, uh, I, I hate to say that because some of them I like. And they're just on a collision course like we all were in that life. There's not too many ways out. Uh, so anyway, 
This guy now, because he was outnumbered in the back of the bar, pulls out a gun. Gregory winds up getting shot in the, in the behind, in the ass. And the next day he comes to the club and he's wearing shorts. We're not allowed to wear shorts. But he tells his father, he got shot. He's got a bullet in his ass. He hits the, the he went nuts. He says, what the fuck happened? So Gregory's laughing about it. He's making a joke because he don't want to kill the guy. It was a fight. It was any, and I think he liked the guy. He was a normal a fellow tough guy, you know, but a little pre probably crazy. And Greg, no, 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 no. You're a good fella. He was a made guy at this point, Greg, junior. And he says, you're a good fella. And he hits the desk. He says, you can't get shot in the ass. You know, like it mattered where he got shot. He said, in the ass, you just can't get shot. I want this guy done it's gonna get it's gonna happen so this is one where now i drove greg in a limo him and joe brewster and uh greg was gonna take him i'm the shooter he's meaning him joe brewster and i were and i was gonna be in another car to take them out of there afterwards but i was a backup also and then we had crash cars uh but Greg shoots him, and I found out Joe Brewster shot, too. He wasn't supposed to, but he wanted to do that for Greg. He loved Greg Jr. Uh, anyway, so here I am getting closer now because, again, it's personal. It's like my brother. Gregory's a brother to me. They shot him. We can't let that go. Then you fall into this mentality that what you're doing is okay. Later on, when you know a guy's getting killed just, you know, because he broke a rule selling drugs— that's a little different. That's a little harder. We just got to whack a guy because he's, you know, it's, it's, it, or, you know, di di different reasons, disrespect, uh, or he's not paying anymore. He stopped paying or afraid he's going to become a rat. He may become a rat. And you just start whacking guys for like, just because you're ordered to, or, you know, we're going to do it. But one thing I'll say about Greg Sr., he never told me, Larry, go kill that guy. He told Larry, take a ride. He was always there. He was always there with Greg Jr. They weren't the type, and there's a lot of them out there. And I'll tell you some of them, you know, some of the biggest names you know uh, weren't, you know, big time trigger men. Uh, I'm not going to mention names. It's, it's unnecessary. But, <laughs> but there's a lot of guys that elevated. Well, I'll say one, Vic Arena which caused our whole family to fall apart. Uh, and we'll get to that. But Vic Arena was eventually our acting boss. He wasn't much of a shooter in his life. But when he became acting boss, because Junior Persico, our boss, thought he could control him from prison. He said, hey, he's not that much of a tough guy. He'll listen to what I tell him. Problem was, he listened to everybody. Okay, he wasn't his own man. He would listen to John Gotti. He would listen to this one, listen to, listen to what people were telling him, and they had their own motives. So he caused an internal war for us, which we'll get to at some point. But, uh, but they weren't trigger men. They were just ordering it. Now, Vic Arena was able to order, whack him, kill him, take him out, you know. And you don't realize it's a big deal to kill somebody. It's a big deal. You're taking a life. It shouldn't be that easy. And it was a time when it wasn't, when you had to go through channels and you had, you know, but the, the newer bosses, you know, some of the names like Gas Pipe, uh, you know, um, John Gotti, it became very easy. Just kill him, take him out. He may be a rat. I dreamed about him being, as Gas Pipe had a dream that a guy was going to be a rat. He just dreamed it and he killed him. Yeah. I mean, so that's when the, you know, part of the reason that the leadership went downhill, the drugs uh, usage, the lack of following the, the rules, the basic rules that we were supposed to follow, destroyed the life. But, uh, but again, going back to where you were, it's not, you, you, it's baby steps and you get acclimated and you understand and then you're in so deep, you can't say no, it's a weakness. Uh, you got to just keep your mouth shut. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain, but when you're there and you're in that deep, there's nothing you can do. When, yeah. yeah. When did you realize that you were slipping? When did you realize that you were becoming lost? When did, Was that a realization early or was it not till later years? But did you feel as if you were losing yourself? Well, no, I wouldn't put it that way. Because uh, some people love that life. We're yeah. all about that life. You yeah. seem to be quite level-headed where you've seen things differently from 
that life. Yeah, no, I, I did then too. Like when I, when I talk about these, these hits and things, it's not easy. And that's why I never get into detail. I don't want to bring up names of people because they have families. They have, you know, kids now that might have heard stories about their dad. And then to see me on a YouTube saying we, we, we shot him 15 times on 86th Street, you know. Uh, but you don't need to do that to get the gist of what we're mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, but no, I the early ones, like I said, that were hand-fed to me for a reason where I actually felt proud. I was doing a service to the community. You know, you actually feel that way because this guy's no good. And again, I'll say it again. What if it was somebody, your own daughter? You know, so that type. Then you get past the act. It's the act of doing it, right? Not the, or the reasons. There's two different things. I've been talking about this a lot lately because I did a TV show not long ago where I was on with a psychiatrist and she's trying to understand how a kid like me became a killer. And I said, and I'm glad I had two days with her because when she asked me up front, it was pretty much what I was saying now. You know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a de developmental. You just work your way there. But I went to bed and I said, you know, if I was drafted at 18 years old to the army, I would probably, because of my makeup, the way I, I am, I would want to excel and become a Navy SEAL or a, a, a sharpshooter, a marksman, you know, those guys that pop up out, you know, that's what I would want. I would want to do that. And I might have 200 bodies if I was in the army. So that marksman has learned to kill. The act of killing is one thing. It's the reasons. Now, generally speaking, most people would say that marksman is doing it for his country or he's doing it for the right reasons. That's arguable, you know, war or whatever. You could argue that it's political or whatever. But so the act of doing it, really almost anybody could. You learn. You do, it, my drill instructor would have taught me to kill in the army or somebody would have taught me, right? So I had, unfortunately, a di different upbringing, which, and again, it's the reasons. I could never justify the reasons of the early ones. Now, when I was part of this family and we went to war, I did a lot of damage with Greg, the two of us, the three of us, my partner Jimmy too, and the whole crew, you know, but towards, as the war went on, it was just the three of us because of the trust factor. You know, you don't know who's going to turn on you to end this war. So it was just the three of us and we had numerous bodies just during the war and shootouts and injuries. Uh, those I could talk about a little more cold-hearted because I was in the life. No change in that. My regrets for allowing myself to get in are there. I'll never forgive myself for being that stupid. <laughs> but once I was in and guys are trying to kill me and take my business and my livelihood, what was I supposed to do? I'm defending myself. And I became vocal because at first, our leadership, no, we have to try to, and our guys are getting killed. We have to talk to, so we have to sit down. Let's try to make peace. And they're talking and talking. Our friend gets killed. Then Hank gets killed. Another guy gets killed. I told Greg, I says, I don't like this. I'm, we're going to get shot one day. I says, what are we going to do? We got to answer back. We got to let them know we're going to at least fight them. I mean, and here I am, 25 now. 25, maybe 26, 27. I'm sorry, a little bit later because the war went on for maybe a year or so and I was in jail at 30. So actually 27, 28. And finally he said, he's right. We got to start hunting. We can't just be the hunted. So we start looking and we start getting a few of their guys and I'm feeling better because now they're hiding out. They're closing their places down. So now everybody's hiding. They're hiding. We're hiding. At least I'm not a sitting duck. Then later on, one of the heavyweights from the other side that we were fighting uh, sends a message to my Uncle Albert, who is my mom's brother, who is what well, I'll refer to as a dinosaur with the Colombo family. He was the only person in my whole family that was connected, and he was well-connected. I mean, for a long, long time. He goes way back to earlier than even Greg. 
you know, to some names that you'll hear, you know, you see in the movies. He remembers when Al Capone went from Brooklyn to Chicago. That's how far back he goes. Uh, and well-respected and well-liked. He was a good man. He did what he had to do. He pulled the trigger. He was a trigger guy, no doubt about that. Uh, but a good man. And uh, he goes to him and he tells him he's going to, Kill, I'm going to kill your nephew if he doesn't come over to our side. So we got the message. I told Greg. He called Carmine, our consulier, and he said he heard the same thing. Nick, and this guy's name was Nicky Black. So he became our number one target. So we went right to where we know he would be for business. The very first day, he comes driving by. And I said it, there's Nicky Black. And Greg said, let's get him. You know, you know, that's literally, that is exactly what was said. I said, there's Nicky Black. He said, let's get him. So we followed, we drove around the, 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 the block that he was making a few stops, picking up money and stuff. He pulls over. And when he does, Jimmy, my best friend and my partner, pulls up alongside of him. Greg's in the front seat. And Greg is fumbling over his rifle because we will backtrack and fill in some of these gaps, obviously, but uh, Greg had AIDS later on. Was it gear? No, 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 no. He got a bad blood transfusion. I'll explain that. But now he was getting dementia, and this was dangerous because he was not making good decisions for us at the end. At the end. And again, we'll, we'll fill it in. Uh, but he hits the wrong button, and all his bullets fall out instead of uh, the safety. He took, uh, he hit the wrong button, but I had a shotgun and this guy just threatened my life. And I know he'll do it. If he gets a chance to kill me. He's going to kill me. So I, you know, I, I had a, a baseball hat, sunglasses and a bandana on. I leaned out the window of the car and this guy never turned. He never turned to look at the car. And we know why we think we know why, because we were, had the car looking like a police surveillance car. We had a siren in the window. We had coffee cups and thing, uh, we had a, a walkie talkie. So he probably saw in the mirror, it looked like a cop car pulling up. He probably was telling his nephew who was next to him, they're rolling up on us because they were following us all at this point. So anyway, I lean out the window. I put the shotgun literally a couple of inches from behind his head and blasted him. And it was a buckshot type of thing. It was bullets spread out and uh, it was, it was, you know, horrible to look at his face hit the dashboard uh, his nose uh there's a gruesome picture of that it's still out there somewhere uh you could see it on probably if you uh, google search it and stuff like that and i heard later on they found his teeth about a half a block away so i mean it was uh but you know that was one that again in the situation i was in I can't regret. He might have killed me the next day. So what am I supposed to do? Was that your first killing? No. No. No, I, it, it was during the war. Uh, there were a few. We had a couple of other hits. We had uh, one we actually killed a guy hanging his Christmas wreath, you know, during the war. He was on a hit previously, uh, a, hit, a hit attempt against us, but he missed, obviously. <laughs> and, you know, we, we targeted him. We found him, and he was, he was hanging Christmas lights around his house and we got you know we uh took him but but this was again this these are the war what my point is the ones i'm talking about during the war i don't mind mentioning their names and i don't mind talking about it because again it was kill or be killed what was it like shooting someone for the very first time were you nervous of course of course very very nervous re, you know reluctant but you know you can't not now you, 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 it, no matter how you know uh did it get easier um the lucky thing for me, it did because it was a war now. It wasn't go kill this guy because he is selling drugs or go kill this guy because he didn't come in when I called him. So you could justify it more? Yes. yes. Does that make you sleep better at night? Yeah. Well, no, for the, but I still I still have nightmares. Uh, those come back and uh, crazy nightmares, you know. Uh, one of them... Uh, you know, I'm an, I love animals. I was always, as a kid, I was good with animals. I have always had pets. I have two cats right now that are like 
you know, like kids to you. It's amazing. I don't know if you have pets. Yeah, yeah, dogs. Yeah, yeah. I love dogs too. That's the only reason I struggle to go away for work. Well, I don't want to, I've got kids, but fuck the kids. I just miss the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have cats because the dogs, you can't travel. It's harder to yeah. get up and go. So, but anyway, one of my dreams recently was one of my enemies came towards me with a gun and he came too close. So I was able to, get it from if you know any self-defense martial arts anything like that if they get the gun too close you could take it right from them if they don't shoot it fast enough so i got the gun from him now he turned he started running away and i'm shooting at him and i hit him he goes down and i'm shooting again to hit him again but there's a paper bag next to him and i shoot the bag by mistake and a little cat comes out bleeding and moaning why is God doing that to me? I felt worse than I, the cat than that enemy. <laughs> you know, I woke up in a cold sweat. I said, oh my God, I killed a cat. And I was so happy it was a dream. It didn't bother me that I was shooting this cock-sucking enemy of mine, you, mean? you know? <laughs> but, but, I, but so it's like, is it God playing with my psych? Don't forget, you don't want a gun in your hand ever again, you know? How did the war start? Okay, that's great segue back to let uh as i'm going along in this life i'm about 26 27 greg uh proposes me to be a made guy and at that time greg jr just went to prison pretty good stretch he's going to be doing greg had uh had an operation that he had to have his stomach taken out from ulcers the doctor botched it and he needed emergency blood donors. So he didn't want to take the hospital blood because he knew this AIDS thing was around. Listen to the irony here. 30 of us go, 30 guys come right away to give blood. One match, one of our guys named Paulie Melly. Paulie was a big weightlifter, used steroids, the needle. He wasn't gay either. This guy was, uh, and we probably have to say it today, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, of course, but, but just at that yeah, stage, no, that's no, how no. it was, yeah, that really was kidding. passed up out, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, I want to make everybody happy. But no, uh, he wasn't, and I mean, I, he was a ladies' man. He had girls, and he was a classy dresser, and he knew his fine wines. Good guy. But he used a needle, and they shared it. So he had AIDS. His matches, again, divine intervention, God, even Greg Jr. says God gave him that fucking AIDS. He deserved it for what he wound up being. Later on, when we get to the uh, coup de gras about who Greg really was. Uh, so he gets one match and it's infected. But he felt, not, he knew none of his men were like that. He says, they're all men's men. They're, he, they're none of them going to have AIDS. The one match and it had AIDS. So he gets the AIDS. That's how he got the AIDS. So now... Our whole crew was the toughest crew in the, in, the, in if, if not the country, definitely the, the, the city or the Colombo family, without a doubt. I mean, nobody wanted to uh, have any beefs with us. If they owed money, they brought it. Uh, we didn't want to talk about it. Yep, here's your money, you know. Uh, so at the same time, Giuliani, Rudolph Giuliani, if you know the name, was the uh, attorney for the uh, state of New York. He puts up this big thing, this like Elliot Ness. He's going to break down the mob. He's going to stop all their businesses, which he did. He did. And he's going to use the RICO Act against them. So all the heads of the families get put to trial, and they lose, and they all get big, big sentences. Or one of our is our boss, Junior Persico. He gets 130 years. So he's never coming home. He's in his 60s when this happens, maybe 65, 66 but he doesn't want to give up the seat, the boss seat. You don't have to. If you're the boss, and this is one of the rules, and it's something that I learned from Greg, and people on the outside who are watching these things should know. There's only the boss is the boss until he dies, steps down, voluntarily says, I'm stepping down, or unanimously gets voted out by every single captain impossible because the minute a guy becomes boss he makes his son a captain he makes his brother a captain he makes close 
long-time friends captains. Is that so he's got backup? Right. So they're never going to unanimously. Now he'll he'll be a politician and he say, okay, even though this guy we don't get along too well, he's powerful, I'm going to make his son a skipper. I'm going to make Vicarina and his kids skippers. So there's a balance, but you have enough that you know all 12 of your cousins and brothers and sons aren't going to unanimously. Those are the rules. So even though he had 130 years, he's still the boss. And I, I'm going to say I think because some people differ on this. His son, Alley Boy, was finishing up a sentence of 12 years and he wanted his son to be the next boss and the reason i say i think because later on i heard that from alley boy he would have left vicarina as the acting boss because when he came out of prison he couldn't take that spot anyway the limelight he'd be right back in he'd be and he'd be violated he'd be back so but they thought the arenas thought that as soon as Alley Boy comes out, Vic is demoted. So Junior goes away for this time, and he names Vicarine acting boss. And I remember Greg saying it wasn't a good move because he's not—he's a weak guy. He Junior thought he'd be his puppet, but he, like I said before, he listened to too many people. So there were other people with gripes or or or, or had some problems with junior persico they either owed a bunch of money that they were never going to get out of uh nikki black went to the other side because when he got made it was with a stipulation he would never rise above soldier never that's hard to swallow when you're a guy a lot of years in the life and you're making all this money with the teamsters and you're sending 30 40 thousand a month up to the boss from the teamsters and you're never going to rise that's it so he went to the other side the Alloy brothers, they had a, a vendetta with the Persicos because the, one of the Alloys was a boss years ago and went to jail, and he stepped down. He says, I'm not going to control this from prison. I'll be in jail for the next 10 years. So he stepped down. He thought Junior should have stepped down. That's a valid argument, but it's not the rule. You could feel he should have stepped down, and maybe he should have, 130 years, but he didn't have to. So June, uh, John Gotti big time catalyst in this war because he had the biggest ego out there out of all of them combined he had the biggest ego and he wanted to be the boss of all bosses but since the commission came around they were all the bosses are equal there's five equal bosses nobody's the boss of all bosses the last one that might have had that was carlo gambino because he was the elder statesman i think they looked up to him as a very wise old man and even the other bosses looked up to him but they're equals so John Gotti felt if Vic Arena becomes official boss, Vic's underboss, Joey Scopo, you got to follow this. This is the backstabbing and the treachery in the life. Joey Scopo, the underboss, grew up with John Gotti, even though he's in the Colombo family. They grew up as kids. They were very close, very close. If Vic Arena becomes official boss, he wins the war and becomes official boss, they're going to clip him. They're going to take him out. That elevates Joe Scopo to boss. Now, Joe and John have two seats on the commission. That's big. And that's part of his whole grand scheme was to be in charge of that commission. So he put a weak guy there. If he would have put a guy like Greg there, when John Gotti send a message to Vic, take this thing, it's yours. They're weak, what are they gonna do? Because that's a thug mentality. Greg would have told him, mind your fucking business, this is our family. You don't care, it's John Gotti or anybody. The chin, anybody that would have approached him with that, that's what he would have told him. And that's what a man, an equal would say. Vic Arena said, oh yeah, you think we could take this thing over? He was weak. And he went along with it. And when I ran into him later on in prison, he came over to me and he apologized. He said, I'm so sorry I caused this whole thing. But anyway, uh, that's how the war started. But Junior went away. He nominated, or he didn't nominate, he, he put Vic Arena in as his acting boss. And his weakness and want, and now his newly found, newly found ego 
he wanted it for himself. How many is in your family at this time? Well, the Colombo family is the smallest family made member wise. We have about 150 made members. This was set in the rules many years ago. And I think the Gambinos have like 400, if I, the numbers are still the same. So you're outnumbered? But, but we had, well, no, it was, we, no, but now it did, the other families didn't matter. They had no say in this. Mind your business. It was our problem. And we had about 30 guys on our side. They had about 120. And I remember our leader, Carmine Sessa, who was under Greg for a while and became the consulier, and big part of this reason, too, we went to war. Uh, he uh, would come crying to Greg, literally, sometimes crying, for help, please. And he says, they got 120 guys. We only got 30. And Greg told him, they got 120 guys. We got 30 shooters. He says, they don't have 30 shooters. And they didn't. They had two or three crews that we was concerned with, that we had to keep our eye on and, and fight, okay? But all of our guys were shooters. So we were okay as far as that. And we, he proved to be right because they went heading for the hills when we went, you know, started going around the city looking for them all the time. Uh, was this one of the biggest wars in the mafia? It was called the bloodiest ever. I mean, you know, uh, you see like movies and things like that, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and stuff like that. Those were all single events. This war lasted for like a year and bodies were dropping in the streets and it was, they called it the bloodiest internal mob war uh, or civil war, they called it uh, in mob history. How does somebody win a, win a war like that? How was how does someone win a war well, like that? When does it come to a conclusion? One side has to uh, give in. And that's a weakness then? It is, but... Uh, Could another be a truce? We were never going to give. We we were never giving in because if we gave in to Vicarina, especially after the bodies, there's going to be sacrificial lambs. And Greg said, "It's us. The only way they're going to trust a, a a truce is if I'm out of meaning him, Greg. If I'm out of the way and you two guys are out of the way, meaning Jimmy and myself, because we did all the damage, a lot of the damage." So if we were gone, they would trust it. Same thing the other way around. If they came in and says, okay, we want a truce. The only way that's going to happen is if some of their catalysts go. And they would have been Wild Bill, Joe Waverly, uh, guys like that, that. That's the only way we would trust a truce and a merger again. Get, put it back together. So, but towards the end, we were ahead. We were winning, and they had a lot of cracks. Guys were coming back. Guys were making deals to come back to the family. So people can actually leave a family? Not a family. We are one. It's, it's the Colombo family. Don't forget, we were fighting amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. So technically, they were under Junior Persico. They were rebels. They were trying to oust Junior and then become the leadership of his family. But when they saw that they were, their days were numbered, little by little, they were coming back in you know sending messages tell junior I, I apologize i got caught up under my cat they were blaming each other and some of them how would you trust them then you can't you can't so i'm saying it's a treacherous backstabbing you know the reason at the end the only three of us we had about 30 guys that were out traveling around and do it greg said we gotta make our circle a lot smaller and he said somebody close to us is going to give us up, is going to take us out just to end this war. So we traveled, just the three of us. He didn't want, and other guys, it's insulting because they're friends, and I still talk to some of them, that they can't be, just, they're worried. He didn't know who would turn on us. But that's smart also. It's very smart, it's very smart. He mm -hmm. says, we don't need a whole bunch of people around. It's, because everyone else has he, to why they'll right. turn and kill each other. and yeah. Especially he, with the main interview, you kind of stay fucking hell. Why would you keep so many people exactly. around you? No, you, you you don't. You you need the people around that you know you can trust and put a gun in his hand, you know, right? Even if you don't have one. And that was us, the three of us, me and Jimmy, childhood friends. We're never going to give each other up. Never, never. And and Greg, we were so loyal to him, it's sickening. And the, yeah. So what sort of damage were you doing when it was just Jews three? We, well... We got Nikki Black, we got Vin, Vinny uh, Fusaro, that was the wreath guy. 
we got Larry Lampese. Uh, we had three shootouts with Joe Waverly. We shot him a few times, and he shot back. He was always ready for us. Yeah, those were mad shootouts. Uh, and, uh, you know, Joe just did a long stretch, you know. And uh, I, I typically don't mention I, I almost take it back that I'm talking about him because he is home now. And uh, I don't wish him any bad more problems with law or i don't think the family is gonna you know go and through any killing right now they all learn their lessons but uh uh anyway he he's back out and i hope he keeps himself out of trouble but uh, uh but anyway no we had a bunch of shootouts uh we, we took out four or five guys and you know we, we even hit a guy that was around the chin by mistake but he was in a social club, a Colombo club. And that caused some concern, figuring now we hit a guy in another family, the Genovese family. But the chin, the boss of that family, sent a message back that Greg already said to us. He said he was a big boy. He shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have been there. And that was a message that came back from the chin. So it's old school. He says he shouldn't have been in that club. So he knew? He knew. You know there's a war going on. Why are you hanging out in a Colombo social club? What about the relationship at the start? Where was she in this? Linda? Yeah, was she? Oh, no, she was, she, was, she was home. She was um, uh, cheering us on. I mean, she knew, like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, we had a police scanner. Uh, so we were able to listen. And this is a great time for me to lead into what Greg, I said the true, the real Greg. We had a scanner. And there was a five-digit code. Pick any five numbers any five numbers in the whole wide world okay and it was a secret code that the fbi and the task force the new york police task force organized crime task force that were working with the fbi they're the only ones that had that code and we had it so we were listening to them as they followed us as they followed our enemies then we were getting information where our enemies were and we're trying to figure this out. I said, how the fuck is Greg getting his info? You know? One of them was Larry Lampese. He says he gets out of his apartment every morning about 3.30 in the morning. He owned the bus company, school bus. So they start out like 4, 4.30 in the morning. He's got to get there before all the drivers. And he tells, tells us he's going to back out of his driveway. Then he gets out of the car to go lock his gate. He's got to do it with a key. That's when we're going to get him. So we're saying, how the hell does he know this guy gets out there? Find out later on. And he used to tell us he had a girlfriend. That's what he called it. Because he we had this big shoe phone too. Like the old days, the stock brokers used to use them. And nobody had cell phones back then. It was beepers or, or that. And he would call somebody. And he called him his girlfriend. We thought it was somebody on the other side that we were fighting. Somebody that was trying to be friends to save his life at some point. Turns out, it's an FBI agent. Greg the Grim Reaper is a government informant for 30 years. And he was getting information from this guy of where these guys would be. And he's the one that told us about Larry by the time he gets out of the house. The next night we went... Lights of the caddy came on, 3.20. We got there about 3 o'clock, 3.10, whatever it was. And he rolls out. And this one, and this is another one that I see the change in me. Because I was saying now at this point, we're shooting guys, we're killing. And they're just, they're not coming in. Why don't they give up? Why don't they surrender? So I remember saying to Greg, I says, you know what? We got to massacre somebody. Look where I went from literally an altar boy at one point in my life to telling the Grim Reaper. I'm not telling the Grim Reaper, we got to massacre somebody. We got to send them a message that they say, this is personal. This isn't business. This is personal now. We're done. Anybody we see, we, you know, really. So this guy wound up being that guy. He backs out. Greg, Greg and I get out. Jimmy's not supposed to get out because he's driving. We need him in the car. Greg shoots him with the rifle. He goes down. He starts crawling a little bit to try to get away. Then he collapses. He's just laying there. And as we get up to him, 
he said something to us. Either he said, do it already, or what did I do? I remember hearing do, do it, or what I do, something like that. And I'm going to tell you why that's important in a few minutes. But now, Greg puts the rifle up, I get the shotgun, he keeps shooting with the rifle, and I'm hitting him with the shotgun. Jimmy comes out after it's all said and done, not after it's all said and done, comes over, and he puts two shots behind his ear. And that's what Greg's trademark was. He told us that his kids. He told me and his, his son on a hit. One of the hits him and his, I, I did with Greg Jr., the guy didn't die until he got in the ambulance. On the way to the hospital, he died. And Greg was furious about that. And this was a very classic piece of work. I mean, it was classic. It was on 86th Street. There were cops all around. We had to have a good setup with the crash cars and stuff. And... He comes over to me and Greg, his son, and he looks us both in the eye, back and forth like that. He says, you never, ever not put a bullet in the guy's head behind his ear. He looks at me and says, that's my trademark. He says, you put a bullet behind his ear. I don't care if you hit him with 20 shots. He says, he could have identified you on the way to the hospital. It's the way he thinks. So I remember saying to myself, this is fatherly advice. To Gregory and me. I was like a son to him by this point. Put a bullet behind his ear. So anyway, Jimmy did that. And this guy was massacred. And it really was the last hit of the war. How dangerous was the Grim Reaper? How many <sighs> bodies has he killed? You know, he told me he stopped counting at 50. Later on, it came out from the FBI. And again, with him being tight with the FBI, there's a lot of undisclosed knowledge, so to speak. They said 200. 200 is a good, is a more likely number for him. So he's got a license to kill because he's corporate, cooperating? Well, they'll never admit that, but yes, they'll never admit that. But he could do braze. He did hits that were like that one I just said. It was brazen. We had no right doing that on 86 we were cops all around you know with kids and hangouts it was like in the movies you see the old days kids would hang out in places you know uh he's the one that the family came to to kill a woman that they thought was going to uh reveal where one of the uh, person goes was hiding out whether she was or not i still don't know but they felt she was greg gets the hit he didn't bring me on that one and I remember him telling me, and I was happy. Woman, I mean, come on. Uh, he said, I know who has the stomach for this and who doesn't. And I was fine with that. And I wasn't the only one. A bunch of us didn't go on that one. It was a tight group that did that one. Yeah, that uh, takes you a different way. Yeah. We'll well, I mean, that because, I, listen, if people are in that game, soldiers are killing soldiers, fair right. yeah, Gangsters are killing gangsters. It's a fair game for me. Right. But women, children, no. that's, yeah, there's no going back from that. A after it was done, scappy. Our captain came in, and I'll never forget him saying, after it was done, we're all going to hell for this one. There's no justifying it, you know? But they knew who to go to, the Grim Reaper, and he got it done. So this guy, the Grim Reaper, who's killed over 200 people, you're having an affair with him. You think you're his brother. You would die for him. You would kill for him. And then you find out he's a snitch? Yep. What's that feeling? <sighs> I remember it being, as I was in prison, I'm in the can fighting my case, tooth and nail, spending all kinds of money on lawyers, trying to fight and win a case. What were you in for? Uh, racketeering, but murder, <clears throat> uh, loan shocking, conspiracy to do everything. When my, when the indictment came in. Is that after the war? Yeah. When we were all arrested. Um, they arrested me in Florida and it was a complaint. They arrest you on a complaint because they had to take time now to put the indictment. While I'm in, I talk to my family on the phone every day. I'm waiting for this indictment to come in and hear what it's about. So I asked my father one day. Did, uh, he said, the indictment came. We got, we got it. So I says, how is it? He says, well, they blame you for everything except Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> I mean, my father has a sense of humor, obviously, but uh, I got the point. So they, every hit, every shootout every conspiracy and even ones that i wasn't on because i was part of the family and i was part of greg's crew so even ones that i really wasn't on they put me in 
and, and that's their MO. They'll just throw everything at you. So no, now later on, I'm, I'm back in MCC in New York and it's funny because the feds have a funny way of doing things and it's all orchestrated and for a reason. They had separations. They would never let me be with Kamai Sessa. They'd never let me be with some guys from the other side, like Billy's crew, because we were fighting each other to kill. You know, you know, even in the can, they're afraid we'll kill each other. But they bring me back from Otisville, which is another prison, and they put me on a floor with Vic Arena. How do you do that? That was our number one target. I'm the number one killer next to Greg in their indictment, not for real. I mean, you know, I, they over do it uh and that's when he came and apologized to me and said he was you know sorry he did he did say i wish you guys were on my side <laughs> but he said i'm sorry it all happened why did that apologize though well he's he's, he's, he's he, well he's no you know what i didn't take it as a sign of weakness i took it as a sign of humility he knows he fucked up if it wasn't for him the family might not have fell apart so everybody's dead and everybody's dead. Guys are in jail. Guys are making deals. Guys are running away. The family fell apart. Because but you're getting tired with it all this time. That's why you accepted that. Well, well, the apology. Yeah. Well, at that point, like I said, to me, bygones were bygones. Let's try to win our cases. You know, our freedom's at stake now. I'm not worried about you right now. You know, you did what you did. Uh, but I, uh, so I accepted it and we talked. But within a couple of days. There's rumors swirling around that Greg Scarp is a rat. So him with two other heavyweights from the Lucchese family call me into the bathroom. That's where we go to talk because usually they supposedly could never be bugged or anything. They're not supposed to bug bathrooms and things like that. So we go in the bathroom and they're asking me, he says, did you hear this? That Greg's a rat? I went after him. I fucking say something like that. Are you kidding me? And I'm ready to I mean, he'd have no shot at me at that point. It's not that he's an, an old senile. He's only probably at the time. Uh, nah, he's, I was 30. Yeah, he's probably in his early 50s. But still, I mean, he wasn't like a, an old. Anyway, I went after him. And I forgot respect for elders. I forgot who he, uh, I don't care. You can't call Greg a rat in front of me. So they get in between and they say, no, no, no. Just uh, we, we're hearing it. We, we're wondering if you knew anything. And after that, I, I moved my, my bed to the other side. I didn't want to stay near him anymore. The next day, Greg Scarp is in court, senior to father, asking the judge for leniency. And his exact words were, I thought I could go home after all I did for this government over the years. Now, that's in the newspaper. The next day, they call me in the bathroom again. Same three guys. I go in, and they're... Uh, telling me how could you not have known that's a bad signal what are you going to try to make me a scapegoat you're going to try to throw it on to me as if you knew i didn't know yeah if i knew i deserve to be killed yeah more you know percent, yeah right so i i no i said i i and I, I was sick to my stomach but again go back to your question i felt like my heart was ripped out of my chest the guy i gave literally put my life on the line for and he threw us under the bus. He threw his son, me, Jimmy. He was now making a deal, blaming the whole war on him and us to help Junior Persico's son. He's still trying one last ditch effort to maintain some kind of dignity in the life. But you were a rat for 30 years. Nothing you could do now is going to change that. Uh, but also I heard he was trying to make a deal where the family would give him some money so Linda would have money to live on. Uh and part of, and because he could have easily said, we had nothing to do with it. You're dying anyway. Say, Larry and Jimmy only drove me. They had no clue what I was doing. So I get a little slap on the wrist. I get five years, 10 years, something. Uh, I was willing for that. I understood that was the life and I'm going to do time. It's okay. But he threw us under the bus. So we're done. We're just, you know, and my, Jimmy was still on the lam. My partner never got arrested. He, we were getting ready to go and, uh, uh, he, we were going to go in different directions and meet up. Uh, but, uh, I got arrested in Florida. What's and the hardest part about finding out a guy who you would die for? You've seen people die. You've killed mm -hmm. people. You've destroyed your whole life. You've broke it's, your mom's heart. What's the hardest thing about your best friend well, turning on you? Everything you just said <clears throat> is the hardest part. You just, these thoughts go through your head that 
how 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 could it happen? First of all, how could he be banned? How could the government allow it? This is one of the most ruthless, murderous men in history, <laughs> and they allowed it. They partnered with him. They were giving us addresses. That's a it's a is a lot of it's surreal. I felt like I was walking on air. I felt like I was in a dream in another world. Couldn't believe it. It was true. Even when it was true, I couldn't believe it. You know, how the hell could, is this, it's, it's like the perfect storm. How could it happen? <laughs> you know? The coppers are pulling the strings and getting everybody to kill yep. each other, saying mm -hmm. everybody out. Yep. They know every bit of information. They know. This is just a game for them. And then, well, well it, they're all, all they're worried about is rising up on a pay scale. That's all they mm -hmm. care about. They don't care Promotion. about anything else. So now they take me off the floor. Okay. And before I was on with Vic, I was, they put me in a cell with Greg senior for a few days, but he had, the, had his eyes shot out, which is a whole nother story. And, um, yeah, what happened when the boss got his eye shot? I, Greg, Greg senior yeah, got his eye shot. Well, the, the Grim Reaper. Yeah. It was during the war. And this is a sickening story too, because there was a ceasefire and we were winning. His son, his youngest son had gotten into the drug business because his father pushed him into it and said, go make money. He winds up getting in a beef with another drug dealer and they, he calls me, I go to the house, he goes, straighten us out, go talk to this kid, whatever. So I get in the car, the son comes out with a gun, I, give me that gun, I locked it in the glove compartment, I'm gonna go talk to this kid, we're not gonna shoot him. So I go, can't find him, go by the house, go by his drug stop, whatever, and I don't wanna do this because I don't wanna be around these people, the drugs, I've never done it, I said, but, there's nobody left. He only trusted me, really, or Jimmy. So <clears throat> I go, can't find him. I go back and say, Greg, let it go till tomorrow. Let everybody cool down. Joey didn't get hurt. It's a business thing. You just handle it tomorrow. He agreed with me. I go home. I'm not home five minutes. I hear the phone ring and the answering machine comes on. I wasn't even going to answer it. And it's Linda, frantic. I think Joey got killed. They, Greg shot and I said, I'll be right there, I hang up, I gotta go back. On the way back, the block that I was on, I saw like a crime scene. All cops, FBI agents, ambulances, fire department, all down the street, May, people all around, you know, the gawkers, the bystanders. But I pass it and I go to the house. I get to the house, there's a bullet ridden car, bullet riddled car in front of it. It was the one I was in with Joey 10 minutes earlier. Greg went back out with him. They went with their guns. They got in a shootout. These guys shot Greg in the eye. But he got back in the car, and the son wound up running off and, and hiding and surviving at that moment. But he got killed later on. He drives to the house, and this is a legendary thing. that It's a story that people love hearing, and... Uh, I walk in the house. First of all, I hear the kid in the car gasping, breathing for his last breath. It's his Joey's friend, best friend. The son Joey's best friend. He got hit in the back of the head. He never got out of the car when the shooting started. Go in the house. Greg is on the phone with the parole department because he had the, the thing on his ankle. He wasn't supposed to leave the house. He's bleeding profusely. He's got a, a towel. He's on the phone. And there's a scotch there. <laughs> he's sipping a scotch while he's talking to him. He says, nah, I never left the house. There must be a problem with the thing. I got to drive him now to the hospital. There's four hospitals within 10 minutes of his house. He insists that I take him to a hospital that I just, is blocks from here, which is, you know, without traffic, 30 minutes from his house. But normally coming to Manhattan, there's going to be traffic. But this was late at night, so there wasn't much traffic. But I got to go through toll booths that have manned by cops. There's cops all around. Same thing. I got to drive a guy believing to death. But I take him. Larry, my loyalty again. I drive him to the hospital. I roll him in. Well, I walk him in. They put him right on a roller. The nurse comes over to me and says, what happened to him? I said, I don't know. He called me. He said, I think he fell in the backyard on a, on a pipe or something. What was I going to say? So she rolls him in the back. 
and she has paperwork for me to fill out, I guess. So she comes back out <laughs> and says, uh, you stay right here. So I said, what's the matter? Okay, don't you want me to fill out the paperwork? She says, stay right here. As soon as she walks away, I go over to the door. I says, Greg, I got to get out of here. He's laying on a gurney like this. And he, all he does, he picks up his thumb. He puts thumbs up to me. I take off. The minute I got in the car and drove, I seen the siren, light sirens. They knew he got shot. So they called for the cops. And I drive back to the house. Now I got to rally the guys. I got to call the guys up. This is why it's such a horrible story, too. On top of everything else, lives being, you know, people getting shot. This kid almost did. This drug dealer, 18 years old, maybe 19, almost ended the Colombo War. All we went through for the last year, this dummy, Greg, goes out and gets shot by some 19-year-old drug dealer. If he would have got killed, we'd be back to square one, where we, and we don't have Greg, our fearless leader, you know? And this is before, obviously, we know he's bad. This was the tail end of it. So that's why he had his eyes shot out when I was with him, in, and he didn't even have a patch. He just had a big hole in his head. It was terrible. We're paying gin together, and I'm watching blood still oozing out of there uh it was crazy but they put me with him i think after you knew he was at a, in prison before this is it's before i went to see vic i was with him so now i'm thinking the feds might have been hoping greg would talk to me about cooperating but he probably saw it wasn't on my agenda it wasn't like you know he probably saw the way i was talking about we got this kid we're gonna fight this fucking thing we got it with you know whatever i was saying I, that's a possibility. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think they put me with him for a reason. Why are you going to put me with him <laughs> when you got everybody on separation? Then they send me to Vic. Then after Vic, and they know this issue went on, the, the security guards know that there's something there between us now. They move me to another floor. Who am I with? Alley Boy Persico. Who's he? Carmine Jr.'s son, Carmine Persico's son, the one that is supposed to take over for Carmine. Uh, and, and get Vic out of the way. He's the son who, the heir apparent to the, to the throne. And now we're talking about Greg because it did come out. It's all over the building. It's all over the newspapers. It's everywhere. Grim Reapers are at 30 year informant, this, that. And I'm talking to him about it. And he tells me, he says, him and his father knew for 20 years. They knew he was bad. So now again, my insides are turning. I said, wait a second. I said, you knew? So the boss knew he was a snitch? The boss and his son knew. So were they snitches then? Well, that's halfway there. You know, but here's the thing. They were using him to do all these hits. He made a fortune for them. And he probably gave them info to help them along the way. Knowing he and, had a license to kill. Well, ma yeah, but making it like say, oh, he's got somebody on the payroll. They they they, they downplayed it, but they knew. So, so they used got, them and but, both used each other. Right, they used them to help <clears throat> themselves. Yeah, but if any of us had done that, we'd be killed. If I knew he was a rat and I didn't say, it, I'm part of it. So he knew he made a mistake when he said it, but he said it because he felt embarrassed that this powerful guy under him was a. So they made. He told me. That's why he said it. Did but, you never have any inkling? No, nothing no, whatsoever nothing. for 20 even his, years? Even his son. I'll tell you one story about the son in a minute. The only time he felt something, and it's a funny story. Uh, no, because he's killing. You can't ever think the F FBI would allow this. If he was just a thief or, you know, Shylock, low-level guy, but he's doing murder after murder after murder. Every time something was in question, He'd go kill somebody. Surely the police should be investigated for that, for giving were, somebody well, a freedom to kill? Because that's the worst fucking crime. Well, the New York uh, New York uh, district attorney went after this guy. And the feds wouldn't do it. They would never turn on their own. So the New York State did it. And he went to trial. And I was called in as a witness to that trial because I gave up a lot of information on him. I had a lot to talk about. And... Big Linda also got called, but she had two conflicting stories. Because early on, I think when Greg died, they kept her on the payroll to help her, to keep her quiet. So when did he die, the Grim oh, Reaper? Oh, God, he died. I was still in prison when he died. I heard it. Uh, 
the 90s, 96. So you are all in prison. You know he's a rat. What's going on then? You know the, the boss knew well, he was a rat. Yeah, well, that's I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to that. But, but just so you know, the New uh -huh. York did go after, after uh -huh. him. But he, he beat it because her conflicting stories. Okay. So no, now we're in there. And I'm thinking to myself, they knew. Who else knew? Did Scappy know? Does Greg Jr. know? Does everybody know? And I, now I'm saying, I'm thinking different. With all this happening, am I going to be the last man standing? <laughs> Greg's, you know, he's going off. This guy's getting out. The comma, they're all, you guys knew. And he made that statement to help Alley Boy, who wins his case because Greg took the blame. He said, Alley had nothing to do with it. A deathbed confession. He didn't put me in the deathbed confession. He threw us under the bus. So, no, my thinking's changing now. So I called my attorneys, and I had a meeting with them, and they said, really, they know everything already. I couldn't come in with any blockbuster. I didn't know where Hoffa was buried, you know. I, Greg told them, our consul year ratted and told them, uh, there were two or three captains that went in and told. So there was really nothing new but the corruption. Now this was trickling out, and I knew about the scanner, I knew about the addresses. They gave us an address. Follow this. One of the lower level FBI agents finds out where Vicarina's hiding. He gives the address to his supervisor. Greg gets the address. Now that underling FBI agent didn't deal with Greg. He gave it to his supervisor. Greg wound up with that address. But here's the key. It was the wrong address. The place didn't exist. So how would Greg wind up with the very same wrong address? They gave it to him. So that proved that the supervisor gave Greg this address. I knew that. I knew this. You know, we had the address. We had the, the <coughs> scanner. Uh, we had a phone that we used. And back then, you got an itemized, detailed uh, list of phone calls that you made. I had that because the phone was... In, somebody in my family. So I had that. And I gave, so that's what saved me. The info I had that, that was all new info to them. That was important and it was on this agent because that would have blew all their cases, which wound up blowing up most of their cases. A lot of guys got out after that. Uh, that's why they kept me in 10 years. So what were you expecting if you never cooperated? What would you have got? Life? Life. Life. So what was the feeling like to go, find out everybody's a rat, what was the feeling to then for you to go and cooperate? Well, let but, me start at the beginning, uh, I'll answer that. You know, facing life was the worst case. You can cop out without full cooperation. You're, you're gonna have to admit, no matter what. So all these guys that are admitting stuff, they're halfway there, but they, they, they wanna light at the end of the tunnel, and I get it, I'm not, you know. Uh, so I was negotiating they weren't coming off of 25 years. Now, I was watching guys a lot worse than me and a lot older that were around a long time, captains, stripes, this and that. They were getting 18. Finally, I think they came down to me to 22. And at the last time, I said, what if I get Jimmy to come in? Not that I know where he is, but if I can help, you know, because they would have given me another charge. Uh, I, I, says, I was trying to get 17. I'm going to tell you why. All this is going on before it comes out about Greg. I'm fighting this. Of course, you got to keep this in mind. There's no way in the world I would cooperate with the government if Greg was still alive and the Greg Scarpa we know because he would stop at nothing. He would kill my family. He'd kill my dog. He'd kill my neighbor's cat. Anybody that he knew I cared for or knew to stop me from snitching on his family. Okay? So I had to make some deal. I was going to get life or... I wanted something. I had a one-year-old son. I said, so even if I get, if I could get 17, I'd be home at 15. At least he'll be on his way to high school. You know, you start working at that. But once it came out that he was bad and they all knew, I knew now I'm making a deal. I'm going to do the best thing I can do. And I bring Jimmy in it. So they call him. When I spoke to the attorneys, they take me out. They bring, they bring me to see prosecutors and FBI agents. And I'm sitting with them. And the first thing I said, any deal I make, Jimmy gets the same deal. They looked at me. No, no, we'll find him and we'll catch him. And the funny thing is, they had no idea where he was. They admitted it later. 
not even a single clue of the direction he was in. He was doing well on his own. You know, and we had a little setup with people, to, but, you know, but I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But uh, so they says no. So I got up and walked out. The next day they called me back again and they were offering me zero to life. I says, what kind of deal is that? I leave again. And I said, and Jimmy, listen up. So I leave. The third day they called me back in. There's a few other heavyweights in there now. Guys from the Justice Department, high level people. They said, we will let Jimmy come in under your umbrella. Okay, but the zero to life, I says, fuck that. They say, let, hear me out. If you help us and you cooperate and work with us, at the end of the time, if the, the, stand, the old thing was zero to 20, if we gave you zero to 20, and at the end of it, we gave you 20 years, are you going to be happy with that? I says, no. I said, no, of course not. I would, you know. The zero is what we're putting on, okay? You can get as little as zero. We're going to do everything possible to get you as close to the zero as we could. They were bullshitting me because they knew they didn't want me out until the trials were over because of the corruption. I would destroy their cases. So anyway, finally I said, and they told me we'll let Jimmy come in. So I said, okay, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. They had to sign the papers that Jimmy gets the same deal. I got it to, you know, to his family and somehow or another, you know, they got it to him. And uh, so now, like I said, it was a whole different ball game to me. It was now it was about survival. It was business, a business decision. I says that the one person I was loyal to, I remained loyal to Jimmy. I didn't make a deal without him. And he came in and we both got, he wound up getting like about five years. I did 10. He did, you know, because like I, there was a bit of a vendetta with me, with them because of what I exposed and uh, a major part of the exposing others did expose, but the, the info I gave with the scanner and all of that stuff was very harmful to them. So if they, I don't think they wanted me to be out publicizing this anywhere. So I got my 10 years and then most of the cases were over except for the agent. Then I had to come back and testify for him. How was that testifying? It was, you know what? Uh, it wasn't very difficult because uh, I think he's worse than any of us to be behind the badge doing the same things we were doing and probably collecting money from Greg and a partnership of whatever sorts it was. Uh, but I didn't lie. They asked me questions like, all I had to do was say, I recognize him. That's the guy Greg went to see. I never saw him. I saw the back of him when he was, he was walking away with Greg in a, in a cafeteria because it was a hospital and they have glass in the window. And, when, and it was the only time Greg wouldn't take me in. I said, he takes me everywhere. And I got nervous. I said, why is he walking away with these guys alone? So I looked in the mirror and, and I remember saying in court, I said, well, how do you know it was an FBI agent? I said, because wise guys don't wear suits like they had. <laughs> they had the cheap suits on. I said, you know, we, Greg had a nice suit on. You guys were in cheap suits. So, uh, but I didn't. And the judge even asked me why I'm testifying. Why are you even here? I says, well, it's part of my agreement. I said I would. And, but you're out. You're home. You're free. I said, and really, I just think it's the right thing to do to honor my, my deal. I said, I made a deal, and that's, that's why I'm here. And uh, he says, okay. I says, you, you didn't need to come here. <laughs> so... He liked me. That judge, a state judge, liked me. I got along with him. He was uh, very smart, charismatic. Mm -hmm. So everybody's dying off. Everybody's turning mm -hmm. on each other. See, when you go out, your sentence in prison, was it a sense of relief because of everything you went through, all the backstabbing, all the misery? You, you know, caused? in some ways, when I got arrested, I was relieved that I was not being chased by the feds anymore. I wasn't being chased by enemies anymore. It was almost like, uh, I've been using this word a lot lately, a reboot. Like you got to reboot things to restart them, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I would have liked to, well, anybody would like to get less. I think, you know, in the scheme of things, when you hear these names of guys getting time served, who's getting two years, who's getting five years, Sammy got five years, and, and he was like the worst of the worst at the time. You know, you hear all these things, and 
10 years was, you know, still to me, it's not life, you know, but they probably could have let me go a little sooner. It was a waste of, it was a waste of taxpayers money to keep me in there. It really was. I already punished myself, uh, punished my family. Uh, the, the punishment factor was gone. It didn't even matter anymore. The only ones being punished was my kid who didn't have a father, uh, the, the wife that had no husband anymore. Uh, you know, my mom and dad who just got to be regretting and resentful of how did this happen? You know, but cause now when I came home and I started fresh and I, and I built up a good life for myself, it's, that's the only way to, to, to kill off the bad memories. Uh, how were you treated in prison? I was treated with tons of respect, tons. I mean, uh, you know, the only time guys didn't uh, get along with me, old time gangsters that were when I was playing basketball with the black guys. That was like, what are you doing? Hanging out with the, and they use a bad word. You know what I hang out with them for? I said, oh, let me do my time. I said, I want to play ball and be healthy and, and you know, get my mind. Away. They want to sit around smoking and playing pinochle. That's not me. You know, uh, I was away the last two years with a heavyweight from the Genovese family that took a real liking to me. And we were walking around the track together every day. And he was talking to me like we were still in the street or we're going to be in the street soon together. I had to stop him and say, you know what? You know I didn't go out like a hero. I made a deal. I'm done. He says, Larry, I know everything about you. He started kicking the dirt, spitting. He says, Greg Scarpa ruined men that were 110% ruined good men. He ruined this life. He ruined us all. And he was so bitter in hatred. A couple of weeks later, somebody sends in a, a paper, a newspaper article about me, detailing what I did with the government and everything like that. And they send it to him like he wants to have me killed in prison. He takes me to the bathroom again and he shows me the thing. He rips it up. He throws it in the toilet. He starts kicking the thing to flush it. He just was so furious of what happened to all of us. He said, like, he didn't hold any, nothing against me. He says, you were ruined, you know? And I won't say his name because I like the guy a lot. Very smart, very practical, reasonable, realistic, understanding, everything that a leader should be. And I fear... He went back and he's the boss. I could never know that for a fact, but of one of the five families. And I did my last two years with him. So that's how much respect I got. I mean, I never had anybody, even I run into people now. You know, I, uh, I ran into one of Wild Bill's guys and my wife Kelly was with me right here in Brooklyn. Well across the bridge in Brooklyn. And he was 20 feet away across the bar. We were looking at each other. We were fighting each other during the war. Okay. And didn't, I didn't take my eyes off him. Looking at me, I'm looking. He took his eyes off, never came over and said anything stupid or, uh, and this happened a few times. I ran into another guy at the, at the track in Freehold Raceway uh, and he was, um, around uh, Jimmy Angelina, who was one of the first casualties on our side, but he went to Vicarina's side, another guy that was against us. And he knew who I was. And we're talking after all these years and he starts going in the direction, but didn't you make a deal or something like that? I told him, stop right there. Stop right there. Keep this cordial. We didn't see each other in a long time. I said, keep it friendly. I said, don't go in that direction. And he stopped. And we continued talking. I, you know, I, I'll probably run into him again because I like that track when yeah. I come to visit the family and stuff. But, you know, you got to walk in somebody's shoes. You got to have their hand. You got to, you dealt a hand in cards. You can only play it with what you have. So I says during the war, that was my car, that was my hand. There was no playing it any different, you know. Even as time went on and I was in prison and this happened, I saw, you know, 
the cards are telling me it's done. You know, I'm, I'm doomed and there's nothing to stand up for except for Jimmy, my partner. You know, so you play them as they come. Do you feel used? Absolutely. We felt used while it was happening. I remember me and Jimmy. Even when it was happening? Yeah, arguing with Greg, saying, Greg, why are we the only <coughs> ones doing anything? He says, because we got the most balls and we're going to win this thing. We don't need anybody else. I mean, he was very egotistical and arrogant, too. He, he just wanted to kill people. He just wanted well, the war. No, he it? wanted to win the war at first. But then with the dementia kicking in from the AIDS and the uh, the enjoyment of the praise he was getting for single-handedly winning this war, you know, with his crew, us, he was eating it up. He was getting nicknames. Now they started calling him Schwarzkopf. Remember Schwarzkopf, the general? Mm -hmm. They got him a hat, Desert Storm General, you know, and he was eating it up. And Jimmy and I were like rolling our eyes saying, are you kidding me? I mean, it, it, this is the Grim Reaper and he's wearing a, a baseball hat that says General Schwartz. <laughs> I mean, it got, got, uh, yeah, really. That is it, psychotic. It's fucking it's, psychotic. No, it was nuts. It was really, <laughs> it became crazy. And we felt, we definitely felt used. We were saying, I said, we're the only ones, we're going to get killed or for what? Or, you know, he's going to, he's going to get us killed. Because he wasn't smart anymore at the end. He, Why did you stay in it then? Loyalty. I just, I couldn't live with myself if I turned on him. I felt that loyal to him. And Jimmy would never turn on me. I would never turn on him. So it was a, a perfect storm. I mean, you know, it was guys that, you know, Jimmy and I to this day would go back to back and, and do whatever we had to do if we were in trouble, you know. Uh, but what a, what a, 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 a ending that he turns out to be what he was. You know, which leads me to your question about, did we ever know? No, we didn't. And Gregory told me a story just recently, Greg Jr. He Are you said, still friends with his yeah, son? Yeah, very good friends. We talk all the time. We're not a Tino, his dad was a snitch. Oh, he knows now. Yeah. No, he didn't know. He didn't know. That's what I'm saying. But he says, you know, lad, it was one or two times I wondered, how does he know? There's a friend of Greg, Greg Jr.'s, that has a barrel, picture of wine barrel big barrel of gems. Now, emeralds, emeralds. You should know emeralds. That's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. But I'm saying now, if they're finished and polished and done up, they're worth a lot of money. These weren't yet finished, but they, they weren't processed yet. So at the end of the day, they could be worth $2 million or $3 million. Again, this is back in the 60s, 70s. Greg Sr. offers the kid 50,000 for the barrel of emeralds. So he said, nah, I'm, I'm going to see if I could do better. He leaves. It's Greg Jr.'s friend from Staten Island. The very next morning, the kid gets arrested and they take his emeralds. So he was telling me, Greg, he said, I almost asked my father, do you know anything about that? He says, but if I would ask him that, it's like saying you ratted on him, you know, he had to just keep his mouth shut, but he really sensed something wrong. He said, my, he sees my father the next day he gets arrested with the emeralds. Then two days later, they, he kills somebody. So he said, no, I can't be arrested, you know, yeah. but he's, that's the one thing he said, the one memorable moment he has where he really wondered about his father was that one time. What's your biggest regret in that life? Well, the biggest regret is, uh, that I allowed myself to get him get in and get in deeper and deeper and deeper i regret not staying with my upbringing knowing those things are wrong and not going that that fork taking a fork in the road i regret taking that turn and but once you're in you're in so i can't and you know and then there's a lot i don't regret about the life so it's weird but the one regret i have is if i could go back in time which i wouldn't because I'll take the same lumps I have now because I have my son. I have a son. If I didn't take that walk of life, I wouldn't have that son. And I wouldn't have my precious wife right now, Kelly, because whatever road I took has to be here today. So, But theoretically, I wouldn't meet him. I would have said, no, this is wrong. We're done after six months of sex and go on 
back to school or go back to the fire department. Uh, so that's the biggest regret. How does Kelly deal with it all? Everything you've been through? Well, we should bring her on the show sometime. Yeah, <laughs> no, definitely. No, listen, I was very honest with Kelly from early on. Uh, she was a vice president, a very big government contracting company. One of, I think, only two vice president females. So she had certain achievements of her own. Uh, did very well. And we met through my gym. Well, I, actually, I didn't have my own gym at the time. I was training in different gyms, and I was teaching kickboxing. And she came to join a kickboxing class, and I was the instructor. And one thing led to the other. Uh, and she got had to make a big decision in her life, too, because when the company found out about me, well, they knew about me. I, I was very open with them. I told them I had a bit of a checkered past, but they were fine with it because they liked me, and I was training half of their company in my gym. Uh, but... Along the way, one of the people at the company got a little jealous that I was doing a lot of work for this uh, contracting company now, and they Google searched me, and they spread it all around the place. So Kelly had an ultimatum. She had to separate with me because she had a very high clearance. She could go into the Oval Office, knock on, she could knock on the door and just walk right in. You know, that's the clearance she had, but with me as her significant other, She'll lose that clearance. Uh, so they gave her an option, either that or, you know, a six-month severance, and use, we have to part ways. I told her, stay at work. We'll sneak around. We'll do what we got to do. We'll get, she didn't want to do it. She said, nope, nope, they're not telling me how to live my life. She took the severance, and uh, we're together. And eventually we got married. But, but she handled it, but she knew from the start. Uh, there were no surprises. As a matter of fact, I would tell her things and later on it would come out in the paper. So where I felt like a bit of a pathological liar, like to this life I lived, you know, mm -hmm. uh, then it would come out. There was a scene in one of the Sopranos episodes where I told her they're doing an episode from my, my life, you know, part of my life, you know, where the guy hits the desk and the FBI agent hits the desk and tells Tony Soprano, we're going to win this war. And that happened for real. Because Greg's partner, the agent, when we got Nikki Black, that's exactly what he said. We're going to win this thing. And the other agents are looking at each other. We are going to win. Is he part of this? And that's sort of what started his downfall. Mm -hmm. But so no, there was a lot, you know, there were no surprises. How is it, Larry, when, because I'm a father, I do everything for my kids. I would kill for them. I would die of for course. them. No, 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 try to be tough but not mm. a blink of an eye I would fucking do what right. I need to do for them but right. when you're killing people hearing people scream and now you've got your son and you should yeah. do anything for it's, it and then you've got Greg who's telling his son how to kill and how to butcher people mm. do you understand how deluded and messed up they were how hard is that to then try and go over everything to for you to become the best father for your son not to go no, down the same footsteps as you it's it was extremely difficult you know when you think about I, like I said, that's why I don't like to talk about those early on ones where the people, you know, were doing something that may not have been 100% right in our life and they get killed. And, you know, we overlook their kids and their wives and everybody else that are really the victims, you know. Uh, but I, I you know, really, really uh, kept my son out of it when I was in prison. We, you know, uh, we told him I was working. We never told him I was in jail at the beginning because that would be a question what did he do wrong you know too young two three four five six seven uh when he came back it was just so happy to have me back that it was easy to just focus on the future and the good things but little by little i had to let him know you know uh because uh you know i was still going to be in the newspapers things there's so many documentaries on tv that i'm on or they're about me uh so i had to break it to him and I did it gently, little by little, and I told him the regrets, and uh, obviously I don't want him to do those things. Yeah, but it's a sad existence to see, as who else did I have one? And their dad was telling them how to kill, their dad was telling them what to do, and, mm. and moaning at them and shouting at them because they were doing it wrong. My yeah. father telling his son how to kill. It's fucking that's, sad. Yeah, I mean, again, like that's that's Greg Senior. He he pushed you into it. His own kids, uh, not all of them, uh, but Greg, and then the youngest one, Joey. He allowed him to get in the in the the drug business, and because the father was so feared, the youngest son 
didn't play by the rules. He thought he can get away with whatever he wanted. As soon as the father died, they killed him mm. in the street. Uh, and it's sad because that was a good little kid. He was my godson. He was a good little kid growing up. Very like our sons. They want to cuddle with you. They want to go to the ball game. They want to play, you know, can I come and play basketball with you today? La? Yeah, come on. You know, we were still athletes even, you know, early on. And um, then there came a point where, and I think it was when Greg got sick, where Joey started dropping out of school and coming to hang out at the club. And I said, what are you doing here? We would bring him back to school. Then Linda and I would drive him to school, and walk, watch him walk in the door. He'd walk out the other door on the other side. He was just losing control because the father wasn't around. When he, you know, And then he liked the club and he liked the money. And at 15 years old, 16, he was selling drugs. And he didn't make it past, I guess, 21. That's very sad. Very, very sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened with the relationship with Linda? Well, after the 10 years in prison, I had three years of uh, supervised release. So there was no way of me coming back or anything. And I had no contact with her in all that time. One of the detectives on the case that I grew up with and happened to be on the Colombo case, uh, which not that far-fetched. It happens all the time. I know a lot of cops that I grew up with. Fireman, you name it. Um, he said that Linda reached out to him and would like to see me. Not that I'm home and everything. So I went to Staten Island. Kelly came with me. And we met in a diner. And it was a nice reunion. It was nice. It was You could see there was some feelings. And everybody was happy to see each other. Everybody looked healthy. Everybody was Well, she didn't look that healthy. Because she's a, a chain smoker. And she was really losing her son. You know, there was a lot that took its toll on her, put it that way. Uh, and then we went back to the house where little Linda was. They lived together, house in Staten Island. And it, you could see that they weren't doing well. You know how a house is usually furnished nicely. Yeah. and It was very bare, the basics. And uh, I felt bad for them. I felt so bad that I had said, why don't you guys leave New York? There's nothing here for you. You know, you're sitting here at the kitchen table smoking. It says, you know, not that I was really doing that well yet. It was early on in my coming home and supervised release. I couldn't do anything yet. I says, move to Florida. I said, you know, I, I, I work in a hotel, right? I did. I had a job in a hotel also. I said, you know, they're always looking for help behind a desk or different things, restaurant people I know. You have to have a job. You have to just restart your life. They couldn't do it. They stayed there. And by the end of the conversation, they were trying to tell me how much Greg loved me. <laughs> and they were still glamorizing him, still idolizing him. And that's where it went sour again. And in hindsight, I'm glad they didn't come because if that's how they felt trying to convince me that this man loved me, he truly, he, I see he didn't love anybody. He didn't love even you people. He loved nobody but his money. You know, uh, I get more into detail about that in my book because, uh, you know, that's the one true love he had was money. Was that about a closure for you, seeing Linda in that state, no, in that no, mindset? It, it didn't, you know, I, I, <laughs> at, at that point, it was either way. I, 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 not, I don't want this to sense, uh, sound uh, heartless, but I didn't care if I saw her ever again. At that point, you know, 13 years went by. We didn't talk. It's not like we stayed in touch while I was in prison. Uh, what good was going to come from it? You know, so, but when Tommy called and said they'd like, to see you. I said, all right, well, you know. So I went. And you know, like I said, the beginning was nice. But then when I saw they were still reliving this, and I had to say to them, I said, your son is dead because of this man. I said, he didn't love anybody. I said, no, I don't want to hear nothing good about him. I don't want to talk about him anymore. And they they, they felt bad about that. They said, no, he loved you like a son. I, come on, come on, you know. And then later on, little Linda reached back out to me again and apologized. And she said, she's very sorry, this and that. And I accepted it. Uh, but, you know, there's really, you know, I, I don't know if uh, there's that, like, where she was once a little sister to me. I, I don't feel that way anymore, you know. Yeah. Uh, and again, that's not cold hearted. It's just if she had been more uh, on Greg Jr.'s side and my side as far as what that piece of garbage did to us mm -hmm. <clears throat> then it would have been easier to rekindle yeah but it's not she's still idolizing him and you know 
uh, selling T-shirts about the Wimpy Boys Social Club and stuff like that, or maybe not selling T-shirts, whatever, but glamorizing that on you know social media yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, so too but, caught up in that life. Yeah. She's too caught up in that life. But yeah. so see when you're going through all the changes, you're out of prison, you've met your wife, you've got mm -hmm. your son. When did the? Because when you start making change, the hardest thing about change for me personally is the conscience. Mm -hmm. Because when you block it out and you become a stone cold killer, you've no emotion. You probably get a better feeling for, mm -hmm. like you say, animals. But see, when you start working on yourself and start trying to change and become a better father and a better husband, <clears throat> how hard is it when the conscience tells you everything that you've done in the past? Well, you know, you got to, what do they say? You got the windshield or the rearview mirror. I look through the windshield, moving forward. Mm -hmm. If I keep dwelling on that, yeah, it's always going to be there. But... You know, there's there's good things happening. There's good things happening, you know. And he, a lot of times, like, uh, I'll do, you know, speakings. or I hate to use the word speeches like I'm a president. But speakings or uh, engagements or book signings. Or I did the, the Mob Museum. I did a, a show at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. And I, I think that there's a, the, the good that could come from this is that I would tell a kid, you don't need the mob life or gang life to be respected or to get respect or to earn respect. And you don't need it to earn a good living. As a matter of fact, it's harder. <laughs> You're not working somewhere nine to five, but it's, it's a lot harder to earn a good live, living in that life. You know, or it's, it's, it's not easy. It's hard work. It's a lot of, a lot of, it's not the easy way out. It's not, uh, it's a tough way out, you know, uh, very few make it to the top and make all that big, big money, uh, but they're the worst of the worst. You don't need the life, you know, you can earn respect, just, I get a ton of respect. Now, I go into restaurants, I go into places, and people gravitate to me. I mean, still, like the restaurant we ate in last night, I haven't seen the guy in years. He was hugging me, and uh, Patsy's, Italian restaurant, not far from here. Uh, I just, I don't know, Greg once told me that when you got it, when you really learn this life, he says, they'll smell you. When you, you don't even have to tell anybody what you are. They'll just know what you are. And I believe that because, uh, and I'm trying to put this in a way where I'm not building myself up, but I still have, there's something there. I walk into a place, I get treated very well. I am a good tipper, so that probably helps. Yeah. Uh, but I can tell you this funny story real quick. And it was when I was back in New York for the, the Vecchio trial. After a long, grueling day, we go back to the hotel, Kelly and I, and I asked the, the guy behind, you know, the, the maitre d', whatever you call it, the guy in the, the bell guy in the, in the hotel, where's a nice place to go where we could sit, have a, some wine and, you know, nice atmosphere. It's all... Oh, I think it was the 555 Club. That was the address. Right around the block, 555. So we were dressed like this. Nice, but not a suit and tie or anything, jeans, whatever. We come walking around the corner. The line is literally a half a block long to get in. So I look, I, I laugh, and we're not going in line. I says, come on, take a walk up. Let's play around a little bit. So I'm walking up, and I was going to go make a comment, like, what are they giving away in there? You know, something... But there's two bounces, and there's this little guy who's obviously the boss because he's on the phone pointing around and stuff. He's on the phone, and he sees me and Kelly walking past the line. He goes like this with the phone. Let those two in. And he goes back to the phone. The bouncers open the thing up. He says, it is a bottle service. You'll have to buy a bottle. I says, have two bottles of champagne waiting for me when I get up there. <laughs> we went up there, two bottles of champagne waiting. We sat. We were, you could touch the Empire State Building. That was the view. So we're sitting up there on a rooftop, drinking champ. But what about me? Was it something I learned from Greg? I hate to say it, the, the way I walked, the way I had the nerve to just walk up there like I owned the joint. I think it's your confidence. Because I've, inter I've interviewed many gangsters, but you are proper, Lanny. You are well, thank you. the real thank deal. You. There's no fucking about but with that. I think it was Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I think they liked her better than <laughs> well, me. But whatever, whatever, but I appreciate, that's a nice compliment coming from you, I appreciate that, but, uh, 
And again, I'll go into places. We were walking here just today. And this is a dot, God's honest truth. You know, you got these kids, these black rapper guy kids selling their things. CDs. So this one comes running over to me. He says, I could see a, a made mammal. <laughs> I, I look at Kelly. I said, is that kid? And I talked to him for a few minutes. I said, look, I'm going to do a show on the way back. Maybe I'll take one from you. I could, you know, I was going to be bothered buying CDs mm -hmm. right now. But it was funny. He used that term. He said, I could smell a made man. <laughs> it was funny. It was just funny. I, you know, but... uh so, you know, some things, you know, it, it, to an extent, you are what you are. Mm -hmm. And maybe at such a young age, I wound up around him. So some of it's not going to leave, you know. Uh, but if, if it wasn't for that and you are what you are, I might be walking around with, like my father is. He always had his fire department shirt on. He always had a hat on that said MIFD. Maybe that would be who I So, I, you know, you are, you are what you are yeah. and who you are and, what was your connection with the Irish man working with De Niro? Well, he read my book and he told me several times it was terrific. Uh, he asked me if I wrote it myself several times. It's almost like he didn't believe it. But I said, no, no, I wrote the book. I said, I got an A in writing in college and I got an A in psychology in college. So both of those things helped me later on. But anyway, uh, some of the cops, like I mentioned, that I grew up with or were on my case are now his security, private security. And he asked if they knew anyone from the old life that would come on board to help him make it authentic. He wants to be, this to be a real, you know. So they said me. They said, Larry. Larry's the guy you want. So it's a compliment in one way. But if you really think about it, I got to tell him how to kill and get rid of guns and things like that. Mm -hmm. Those are questions he asks. How do you get rid of weapons and stuff? And he says, you don't mind me asking you. <laughs> I said, it's public knowledge right now. Don't worry about it. But uh, so he had me read for a part. Uh, and I think a lot of that was more in hindsight, I think this to let the other actors see on film, how a gangster talks or whatever. Uh, but anyway, he got me, I, I wound up with a part as a hitman. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, perfect part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was a good look, nice little scene. We kill Albert Anastasia in the, uh, in the, uh, barber seat, but it opened doors for me. You know, it opened doors. I wound up in another uh, a role where I played a corrupt ex-cop that is uh, suspected of murder. And he works for, it's a true story, he works for Tony Spilatro, who is the Joe Pesci character in Casino. So it was a Vegas murder. And, you know, I had a couple of good scenes, good talking scenes. I was behind the bar. I had a banter with the cops when they came to question me, and it was really good. Uh, it was called The Perfect Murder. And I've, like I said, done numerous documentaries. But the greatest part is the book is is well-received. Nick Pileggi said it was, uh, uh, his first words out of his mouth when I met him. You know who Nick Pileggi is? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Goodfellas Casino, for the people that don't. Uh, he said- Is that the needle what Pileggi does part? And, and Casino? Goodfellas and Casino. Yeah, yeah, yeah he yeah, wrote yeah, both of those yeah, books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, screenplays. He said, Larry, you wrote a classic. You wrote a mob classic, exact words to me. I was so humbled because he's the, he was the number one guy at the time. Now he was older and he was trying to help me along, but it's a big undertaking to get a series to go. So I hook up with another uh, man named Joe Paletto, who is a producer and he's been around HBO and different things for years. He came on, we're partners now. And we have a, a TV station called Mob TV. It's early on. It's a couple of years in. I did a talk show on there uh, where I bring in ex-mobsters and ex-cops and ex, you know, different types of, different walks of life. Uh, and the, Terrence Winter, who wrote Wolf of Wall Street, Sopranos, Boardwalk Empire, a whole bunch of really top-notch mobster stuff, is a partner in Mob TV. And he stepped down from the Tulsa King recently because he wasn't getting along with the co-writer to take on mine so now he has the life and he wrote the script and he's his agency is in not in negotiations but they're in talks with uh various uh networks to hopefully have a five-year series so it's opened phenomenal doors for me uh and he said it's the best mob book he ever read true mob story true and it's you know 
it's not that hard to believe. And I'm going to say it again, it's not out of my ego because I've read so many of them. And a lot of them are written by a third party. And it's a historical type of thing where it's almost like a textbook you read and then you could see it's coming from 302s from oh, court transcripts or newspapers. I got a book for you. So hopefully you'll oh, read it you. and you'll see coming from the horse's mouth. Uh, I've heard people say they felt like they were in the car with me uh, or they know the places I was describing, you know, uh, and it's in a layman's language. So you just feel like, uh, and I get that. That's what I wanted. I'm happy they say that, you know, uh, but I've like, it's Armand DeSante wrote uh, an incredible testimonial. Uh, on the back, I have it on the back page. Uh, I haven't come across anybody that hasn't said it's phenomenal and it should be a movie or a TV series. And now I'm there. I mean, Terrence wrote the script. He's talking to heavyweights and big networks. So I think right after the holidays, I got a good feeling it's going to be a good year. Uh, yeah. Where can people buy your book, Larry? Well, I, there's a little story to this too. It won't be long. Yeah, I'm, take your yeah, time. No. I first went to uh, try to get it published with companies. And unless you're a seasoned writer, like let's say Grisham or uh, the guy that writes the Stephen King, they're not writing a big check. Okay. They're going to give you 30,000 is the biggest offer I got. And it sounds like a lot to some people, but not with my vision. I said, I wasn't going to have a be partnered up with a publishing company when I know this is going to go somewhere. That's how I felt. So I did it myself and I sell the book at a website, www.larrymazza-thelife.com. So it's my name, dash the life. That's mm -hmm. named the book. And I sign every copy that goes out and people enjoy it. I get comments back. That was so nice of you. So kind of you to take the time. And I enjoy that. I hope I never change. I want to keep doing that. Uh, but that right now, that's the only place. Or if you like the Kindle version, but you don't get the pictures, uh, and if you like reading on a computer, you could get it from Amazon. But you go to the website and you get the, the, the you know the hard copy. And like I said, it's signed. It has all the pictures. Has updated pictures. Has me and De Niro now. Me and the Irishman, uh, Armand. I met Mike Madsen. You know who Michael Madsen yeah, yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. He was a fantastic guy. Uh, and he's in there now, Nick Pileggi, of course. And the next version is going to have pictures of me and Terrence and others mm -hmm. too. So, uh, but I will, when the time comes, like if this, if and when, and I'm going to say when, because I feel we're there, it becomes a mainstream thing like The Sopranos was and people are, then I'm going to go back to a publishing company and say, now do you want it? you know, with Terrence Winter on there and it's a big hit TV show, then they'll give me probably an amount that I'll say, okay, you could take it over and handle it. You know, I yeah. won't be signing them anymore, but... Uh, yeah, this is the thing with yeah. people with getting published, they, they they get a very small percentage and yeah. then they can use their book and script to turn it into films and documentaries and they don't get anything. Yeah. So there's a lot of sharks out there. Yeah. People need to be careful. Going forward for the future, Larry, what's your plans? Well, hopefully... Uh, you know, the, you know, I have my gym, yeah. so we spend a lot of time there. I have a lot of trainers that use the gym. Uh, you know, we have a very healthy lifestyle in Florida. We ride our bikes. we active. Uh, and I'm hoping I get another busy run with the, with the series. That's really what I'm hoping for, uh, where we'll be on set. I'd like to get a role. I'm sure I'll wind up with a role. Uh, but, you know... That's going to be time consuming. And I was thinking, and it's funny, that, you know, a lot of shows that are filmed, supposedly New York, are filmed in Toronto. Did you know that? No. Because it's a lot less money and it mm. looks, and the buildings all look the same. It looks like Manhattan. It, did you ever see Suits? Yeah. You saw Suits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I love that show. Mm -hmm. uh, that's filmed in Toronto. But you see the Park Avenue sign, and everybody thinks. So I was just. I don't know what made me think that's the way everybody's doing it, but Terrence just made a comment. We are going to film in New York City, in New Jersey, where this whole thing took place. That means he's all in and very, very, he wants it to be authentic. Mm -hmm. And an example I give is like Nathan's. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if what are we going to make, build up a fake Nathan's? Yeah. We had a lot of meetings at Nathan's and then we walked the boardwalk talking along because you know the boardwalk isn't tapped. You don't think so anyway. You can 
to have a nice long talk and uh, be private, you know? And what better than really zooming in at Nathan's and then us walking up to the, I mean, it's, you can't beat that, things yeah. like that. So the authenticity uh, is going to be there. And but that's a lot of money. So the yeah. budget's going to be big. That, but that's a good sign. I think with that story, you've got to go all out. I think because S Sopranos for me is one of the, if not the best TV show of all time. Yeah, it's Tony okay. Soprano, it played, mm -hmm. unbelievable, the part the big man played. But just before we finish up, how important is it to have a good woman? by your side and oh, like it's you, you, it's immeasurable you just you, you, and and not only she in my case she's my best friend my manager <laughs> uh that's funny my agent no nah, it's it's you, you, i'm sure you have one in your life and you 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 get it uh very important and i i will say this i was blessed with good women in my life and uh even Linda, you know, when we were together, she, it, we, it, it was, it was, I had no complaints and on a relationship, uh, but none like I have now. I'm, I'm at the top of my game. Larry, for anybody watching that's maybe wanting to get involved in a life of crime, what mm -hmm. advice would you have for them? Um, I, I'll repeat what I said before because I believe it firmly. You don't need the life for respect or to earn a living. Why else would you get into that? You think you need it to earn money? You don't. You can make a lot more money. The time you're going to commit to doing stupid things, all that time, you could make it through law school or you could make it through medical school and you'll still be young. Be smart. Listen to your parents. No parents is going to tell you, go join the gang, go be a member of the Colombo family. I should have listened. Okay? You don't need it. You can make a living and be a respected human being without that. You'll have more respect. Larry, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, I mean, I think that was great. You were great to work with, and uh, I think we touched it all. And if, if 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 anything comes up along the way, you'll have to invite me to Scotland. Anytime, brother. I'll come there and we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll do part two. Anytime. Maybe after the show comes out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But I've done 400 of these, and I don't say this often, but when I do, I'm normally right. This is one of my best podcasts I've oh, ever good. done. I'm very happy to hear yeah. it. And listen, for coming on today and Thank giving you, me your time, yeah. I, I very much appreciate it. Yeah. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. God bless you and take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, brother. Yeah.